Greetings, family. This is Bomani Tamba and family. We are live on Revolutionary Cam. And family, welcome to another session with my good brother, Kala Genesis. All right, and that's it right sure. there, family. You know, tonight we're going to continue from our last conversation when we talk about Afrikstan. All right, so tonight's conversation is building Afrikstan versus America, while we need our own Black Power Nation for economic development. And uh, we're going to also talk about land, infrastructure, nationhood. So we're going to get into all these concepts and break it down. And before we get into all of these things, what I want to do is share with you a journey of a lifetime and the next journeys that we have on the African continent. And uh, Kala, let me know if that looks uh, good to you. Looks good. Looks good, brother. You can see the flyer. <clears throat> all right, so family, these are all of our links. I'm trying to get this one to show a little. <coughs> You're going to have to do this. There you go. And so family, these are the list of the journeys, Tanzania, November 17th to the 28th, 2022, Ghana, December 24th to January 5th, Senegal and the Gambia, March 30th to April 10th, 2023, Ghana, May 24th to June 5th, 2023, Liberia, July 20th to the 30th, 2023. And that is one of our historic journeys. And that's the only journey we have not physically been on yet. And uh, we're going to build up the energy from the ground up. We have the most incredible itinerary for Liberia. And you can see all those details right there below when you go to our website, africaforafricans.org. And you'll see this relative information for all of these uh, journeys. All you have to do is click, open the details, and just read. As we continue, Tanzania, November 16th to the 27th, 2023. And South Africa, December 24th to January 4th. So those are the journeys that we have, family. That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven journeys in the next uh, 18 months all together, six different African countries. And these are full tour packages. And we're talking about uh, literally this full accommodation. Your flights, I want to explain things about the flight. Family, um, most people travel with me live in the U.S., so wherever you are, that's where we get your flight from. If you're from, you're in Seattle, Washington, and you're looking to go to Accra, Ghana with us, we book your flight from where you are. You don't need to pay for any, um, you know, any connection flights and things like that. Uh, so we have things a lot more organized and strategic uh, beyond most people. When we built this organized operation, it was to accommodate our customers, accommodate our brothers and sisters to make sure that you get the best introduction into Africa, stress-free where we help you from your passport to your visa to all of the in and out of the different countries. And all of that itineraries are based on roots, culture, business, investment, nightlife, shopping, networking, giving you this uh, incredible nine to 10 days on the African continent based on the journey that you're traveling on. So all the social links are right there. Got over, you know, over 3,000 videos on YouTube and this tens of thousands of photos on Facebook. And all of these are based on this uh, starting in Ghana in 2006, all the way up to the different countries now. So you have, you have literally over 15 years of documentation with us traveling and doing business in Africa and making your journey incredible. So all of the video highlights are there, photos are there. So check them out family and reach out to us and we'll get you uh, ready for these wonderful journeys. I got another fly that I want to share also. Let me ask. And we're going to get you ready, family, ready for what we're talking about. All right, let me find this wonderful flyer here.
Yes, Carla, you can you see this? Uh, Perfect. Nice part? Yes, brother. So that is our Black Star Pan African community. So as we're talking about uh, living, doing business, and making moves in Africa, let everyone know that we have active operation going on. And this is our biggest investment right here, this 15 and 60 acre community. Uh, combination of residential and commercial. The first 15 acres is set for 50 plots of residential land. And then we have, we're set to build a nice business and a nice community center so we can run a whole lot of business technology and community operations from those um, yeah, nice setup. So it's a unique uh, setup that uh, we have and we're working on it little by little, getting things in place. Now, this is a long-term journey. I mean, it's something that you have to be ready to put your time into and work it because right? you're building from the ground up. And that's what we have all the documentation as far as the videos and conference calls and, and things like that uh, from September 2019 to show you the growth going from raw land at, to clearing land, to building homes, to putting things in place. So what we talk with you tonight is based on experience, based on what we're talking about, based on being in the game, based on being in this world, not being like some of these uh, people out there that, that literally just have no experience in what they're talking about. They just there to gossip. They there, you know, they there like uh, spectators and also there as commentators, you know. But we're there living a the real life. When you talk about Black Power Nation building. You know, we walk that life. I tell people every itinerary that I have set up, you're looking at close to 90 to 100% black itinerary. That means all your restaurants, your hotel, the people you're spending your money with. And this is this is outside of the airlines, literally. You know what I mean? Uh, and that is uh, something that um, some people don't focus on, but they talk about black power and pan-Africanism and nation building. So I'm always telling people that, Anyone can talk about these things, but it's a whole different story to live that life. And that's the life that we live. And that's what we're telling everyone, you know, focus on the documentation. And not, not somebody's YouTube channel. I don't care how many subscribers they got. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know I me, mean? I'm one of them people that's real about what we do. We know we're not in a popular, it's not a popularity contest. You know, we're trying to build a future for our people. We're trying to put the best elements of making sure that our future have things in place to where they can compete with the rest of the world and not be consumers or victims <clears> of the rest of the world or be you know modern day slaves or future slaves for the new economic power. You know, people say white people phasing out. Okay, white people phasing out, then Asians phasing in. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you just you you're changing the time frame or the flow of what, who who controls things from from you know, versus focusing on what we can do to build what we're building. So what what you're looking at, family, uh, surveys and things like that, and land layout and frames and homes and things like that, these are things that you're setting a foundation, you know, because land is the base of independence. And, you know, you, you're talking about an area where you have beach access. You can transform the entire area. You can build <clears throat> an incredible town, a town that's focused on uh, – the connection of Africans in the diaspora, putting their money together with people there in the country, local people or the rest of our folks international and getting into the, the world of just uh, economic development from building factories, uh, building resorts, you're, building, you're, you're expanding your farm and operation, you're doing trades, import, export with your own folks from different countries, uh, you know, from America to the Caribbean islands. You're not limiting yourself. Uh, but this provides a base of us coming together, looking out for each other and being in a foundation where we can focus together. A lot of times we run off to the African continent and literally it's a situation, brother, to where we make a move. And then next thing you know, you have this amount of money set and you have things organized. And then by the time you turn around, you know, what I mean, everything is gone and you didn't get anything accomplished. And these things are quick to happen because what's going to happen is people are going to just look at you as like a cash cow and they're going to do what with a cash cow, milk, 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 milk you to where it's all gone. And you have to be careful about that when you're, you know, you're doing business international because 
your focus is not to just go and just give everything to the, the local people. Your focus is to build something to where you're recognized as an organized group and you can work with other organized group in the country together to where we can respectfully build something together as black African people, you know? So this is one uh, concept right there as far as just making it work in Africa. The other concept is what you're gonna break down to the highest level <laughs> and, and family. Uh, if you haven't been following what we've been talking about, it's very interesting. And I'm telling people, open your mind and it's no disrespect to anything. You know, we're talking about stolen Africans who have been brought all over the world. I'm, you know, I was born in Jamaica. My brother here was born in the U.S. And, you know, we literally find ourselves in the same situation, find ourselves in a homeless situation to where we truly don't have a nation that supports us, uh, to where we can, you know, even say the nation or the countries where we're from or living, say they have our back and, you know, they're going to connect us to our homeland to do things. But that wouldn't make any sense. You know, why would your, you know, your, your, your slave master want you to have economic freedom and economic empowerment? Or why would your slave master want to give you reparations or give you anything? So I'm telling people while you're here and you're building all these great skills and you have a wealth of opportunities in America and you have access to finance and things like that, you have to think about what Amos Wilson have always talked about, the blueprint for black power of putting your financial resources together, not just trying to make some things happen in America, but also you're offsetting a lot of that vision to build in the motherland, you know, in Africa is it. Africa is, you know, I've been in many parts of the world and you know, that is the least of the development world and that is the most of the land and most of the resources available. And that's where our connection from and that's where it's, so it's like many different reasons why Africa makes sense for us to make these move. And it also, what you're gonna break down also makes lots of sense as you break down territory and locations and things like that. And also, I'm sure you're going to break down uh, the Zionist movement of how mm -hmm. they moved and and you know and set up land to where they're you know building their operation. And you can't build a nation and build an operation to really be independent unless you have land and and things like that. So we want to educate people more on those things. Um, I took a journey to New York uh, uh, City to uh, you know you know visit um, you know you know you know visit the old neighborhood and everything. And what I realized was a lot of the the, what we call the hood land and empty lots. You know, we didn't, you know, you know, what we looked at as valueless, other people came in and paid top dollars and then flip it to where it's twice as much to where the values has gone up even in, you know, you know, the unique part of New York City, which is this Brooklyn, is this a little bit of everything in 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 in, in Brooklyn. Uh, but mostly what you see also is you no, know, you see hoods. You know what I mean? So when you when people when people are saying that this is a hood or whatever, or this is a desert, or this is whatever. I mean, when I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing cities being created out of desert from Egypt doing it to uh, you know, the Arab Emirates doing it to uh, Saudi Arabia doing it to Qatar doing it, you know, to even China doing it. They've blown up mountains and building airports and new cities and things like that. Uh, and all these new things are being designed. There's one common thing that they always have in it is the modern day and a smart technology you know so when i'm telling people that don't complain about these old jobs that get phased out you know people have been complaining that about that for a long time i've been in the world of technology since i was 13 years old and that's just been you know that's my money maker that's you know my access to getting everything else done and you have to keep you have to keep on growing and learning and developing An example if i learned aircraft technology 50 years ago you know, modern day times, you know, we have incredible jets now. We're not flying with wooden planes and things like that anymore. You know, we have evolved as a people. And if you don't evolve, you're going to get stuck in time and you're going to be up. <laughs> and that's the fear of us as a people, that everyone else is advancing beyond us. And we're not looking at the flexibility opportunity. So we had to present some wonderful information. So my brother, Kala Genesis, uh, give an overview of what we talked about last time and then just go into it, go into it and break it down. And let me pull it back up for you right there. All right. Topic for the night, my good brother. All right. Well, we talked about last time, building on what we talked about last time, the idea of an Afrikan. Well, first of all, before we could talk about that, well, we have to talk about what we mean Afrikan, right? People say, oh, you're going to colonize? No, we're talking about mm -hmm. a, a territory. Everything is a territory. 
The average set I envision should be no should be no more than twenty five square miles, twenty five thousand square miles, right? That's about the size of about half the size of the state of New York, right? Now, if you look at New York City, right? New York City is only five hundred square miles, you know, eight nine million people, okay? So, so the bottom line is this: what we're talking about is territory, right? Land. Without land, you cannot have wealth. You cannot have it a basis of wealth. Land means that you control the sovereignty. The sovereignty, that means the eco, the econ, econ, economy, where it generates, right? That means from the soul of the, uh, the core of the earth to the atmosphere, you control. You control what goes over the seas. You control the ports. You control everything that goes on that, that, that nation. You control, you license, and you have absolute control over what goes into the country, what gets built, how it gets built. It's all saying uh, what good sh what should be produced, uh, how it should be produced, and who decides what was produced. For 500 years, we've been eating in the West, right? And we have never been in a situation where we control those means. In other words, we're, we're just in consumers. We don't produce anything. We just consume, right? We have no say-so over not only what we eat. We have no say-so over what we feed our minds, you know? The uh, Khalid Muhammad, Dr. Khalid said, he said that the, the media and the, the education are the killing fields, you know? When you go there, it, when you watch TV, right, the images of your place in America as a black man is made to feel, make you feel inferior at the bottom, so you know your place. When, when uh, you're intimidated by white people, you're angry all the time, you feel out of place. That's because you're living in somebody else's reality, somebody else's fantasy you don't control the context of where you live or where or you had no choice in it black people in america in the west right had no choice in becoming part of america we never asked for this okay so therefore um see this as this i knew it said high existing sovereign that's another thing right we're going to talk about too are african nations really sovereign and i must tell you they, they're not i'm going to tell you i'm going to say african nations aren't sovereign right African nations, what you see right now, are just nothing but placeholders for European powers to exploit. There are no real nation states in Africa. None. You know, a couple of them are coming close. Paul Kagame, Rwanda, and stuff like that might be coming close. But there's no real nation states. What we talk about when we talk about an African stand, a nation. What is a nation? A nation of people, of, of single mind, one God, one name, one destiny. You know, one usually one past. One, one past. We have the same... Heritage. What unifies us in the diaspora, we're all slave descendants. That's that unifies us. That bonds us together. We were both ripped from our ancestral homeland, right? We were endured through the hells of North America and the Caribbean, everything under a brutal system, right? And we never received compensation or justice for this. We were taken off the ans our ancestral homeland by force, right? Now the people will say, uh uh, they we're gonna talk about that too. Oh, people say, just go to Africa, right? And we see, like I said, years ago, I said, no, that's not a good idea. We need we need to build either what Bomani's doing, the Black Star Power Committee, where we're, we're in groups and numbers, and ultimately a nation state of our own. See, the Black Star, uh, Black uh, the Black Star Pan African Community is part of the the idea of an African state. That means people who have the same history, same heritage, and everything, the same mindset of the world, right, should live together in Africa to build their own communities. Now, what's the point of that? The point about that is this. You have people going to Africa, right? And ask yourself, well, where do you go to the hospital? Well, we don't have any hospital built. Now, if you guys built a community, right? You have your own clinics. You have your own credit union. You have your own mail depot. You have all those things. You have your own auto mechanic shops. You have all those things in one particular area where you network with each other, where your money's turning over with each other. And therefore, you can lobby the host country or the host area and say, hey, you know something? We need this pipeline built. We need this power tower built. We need this road built. We need this right here. And then also, when you build a town, you have your own tax base, you know, where people are paying sales tax, people are paying real estate taxes, people are paying tax on luxury, whatever like that. You have your own tax base. You control what uh, uh, is built. You could you get hand out licensing. And fees and all the stuff like this, like that, that you are, are privy to have a, a municipality. Go to your local town. I was the other day, I had to go to the city of Chesapeake to pay my taxes, right? 
and my property taxes. As a matter of fact, I moved. To, I've been in Chesapeake for four years now, right? I used to live in Virginia Beach, right across the border of Virginia Beach. You know, a uh, 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 border, right? So the city of Chesapeake and the city of Virginia Beach were both taxing me at the same time, right? But come to find out, since I got a new, I bought a brand new car last year, right? And they basically, the city of Chesapeake got a win that I had my car, right? And so they be, they began billing me, even though they were billing me the whole time. So anyway, I went down there and I said, look, you know, uh, I, I got to register my car. You got to hold on my, you got to hold on my taxes. And they said, you haven't been paying. I said, I've been paying Virginia Beach. So they called Virginia Beach on the phone and said, yeah, he's been paying for us and everything like that. They said, well, he's been a resident since 2018. We have a record. They said, well, something got screwed up here. So both cities wanted my money, right? I said, well, all the money I paid to Virginia Beach over four years. So anyway, they cut a deal where they cut two years, two years off, right? And the one of the property taxes that I owe, uh, they just put it forward. So I walked out paying like 600 bucks out of my pocket, you know? I said, okay. But what I, the point I'm trying to make is this. I was in the tr uh, the, just the Treasury Department, right? And the one lady, the older white lady that was there, right? She had a big, she was on the phone with this guy. I listened to her phone with the guy. She goes, according to your deed right here, you don't own this land right here. This land has water on it. So the property assessed this, this, that, and the other thing, right? And the city, and she's responsible for, for collecting taxes on everything, billions of dollars in the city of Virginia Beach on residents, property, uh, you own a horse, whatever like that, car, personal property taxes. And I said to myself, but I, so I said to myself, if people will go down to your local magistrate, your local city thing, and watch how your city government works, right? You got a council who votes on stuff, right? They have a budget for the year. They got to vote on a budget. You know, people put proposals up and everything. All these basic things of government, right? We basically seem like we can't are not capable of doing. So if we basically uh, go to the African continent, we have to build our own uh, government. You know, municipalities, our civic civic organization, and stuff like this. You have the police department. You have the fire department. You have a jail. This and also not everything when we start talking about nation building, right? Is pleasant, right? I'm gonna talk about some stuff tonight, right? When you talk about the nation state, right, there's a lot of things that ain't pretty. I'm not talking about building a Disneyland. I'm not talking about building a fantasy true like that. When we talk about a nation state, you're talking about arresting all that foolishness that's in you, right, and living according to a law, right? The law means that uh, we have the, the state has the sovereign right to tax you. The state has a right to constrict you for war. The state has a right to judge you. We have courts. And the state has a right to penalize you and put you in punishment. That's what you are when you become a part of any society, any nation. And the African state is no different. So therefore, your allegiance. So if you are uh, uh, do things like uh, uh, um, uh, sedition, treason, all the stuff like this, these are the things people don't talk about. We talk about nation building. These are things you have to get straight first, you know, before people say, yeah, there are rules and there are laws. There are rules, law. People, the nation sets the rules up and everything. The state basically makes the rules into laws, which everybody by law is bound to bound to respect or, or the penalty of punishment. We as black people have surrendered that for 500 years to another race of people. They set the rules, right? It's based on their, their perceived view of the world. And they make the laws, and we're in their system. They give you certain room to wiggle with and everything like that, but it's still their system. What I'm saying is this. It's time for the black race. And also, under their system, then so far you're going to get. This so far, and I'll say, I'll say well, Colin, what are you talking about? Okay. When I first moved down uh, here in Virginia, right? I first moved down here in Virginia, right? And I noticed certain families, Kellums and all these other people, you know, the Cliggers and uh <clears throat> the fox and everything. I know I'll start seeing all these. Uh, 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 what's a uh, um, uh, what's the other name? I can't think of the top. It'll come to me. And I start seeing these common names. Oh yeah, such and such family. Now uh, Newport, you know Christopher Newport. You know, there's a statue of him in his Newport. Christopher Newport in the 1700s settled in Newport and found in the Newport News, right? And I didn't know where. Also, I saw the big statue, right? The big statue of him in the in the river on the James River. And I saw he got, Christopher Newport has different colleges, institutions, everything. Black folks go there, you know. And this guy was one of the original slave traders, whatever like that, and European explorers that settled in this area right here, right? But hundreds of years later, he's still celebrated. Christopher Newport Foundation, Christopher Newport 
uh, uh, child uh, uh, stuff, right? He built the infra initial infrastructure of this area, and he's going to be celebrated forever. So what I'm talking about is this. You have people here that have families, right? And I said to myself, I, I did not realize, right, the black folks, they have a little bit of money here, there, and everything. But the white folks, right, this is, this is I'm going to tell you something right now, so it'll shock you. They have so much wealth, right? While we go out there and try to hustle, make a job and everything, you have whole large sections of white people, right, who all they do is collect money. They own the real estate that the hospital sits on. They own the land that the uh, courthouse is built on. You know, they go all the way back. They have a, they have, they are so far ahead of you and everything. The land of Virginia Beach. I'm saying, how do these freaking doofy looking people own? Oh, oh, this family owns part of it. It'd be some white trash looking lady or not. Well, she's worth millions of dollars. I'm like, how the hell? I said, to myself, I said to myself, this is not fair. And then I'm saying to myself, they talk to you like, oh, yeah, you know, you got to get off here. Well, it's my property. Or whatnot. They know why. Because they own the property and the way the laws are, why not? The police come, why not? Whose property is Yeah, you got to get the fuck out of here. She owned the property. Well, wh why does she own this, all this land right here on the ocean front, right? And nobody, uh, like, because she does. That's the system. See, this is what I'm talking about here. The black man in America, right? We, show me one thing that we own, right? That anybody else has that didn't need it. We don't. There's no section of the city of any city in America where, oh, such and such family owned this land for such and such years that uh, we're paying rent and we're doing real estate. It doesn't exist. White people are so well set. So what they do, they know they're well set. The, uh, the, the apartment buildings you see owned by their, their trust, their, their families have trust funds and everything that they own, uh, uh, real estate, everything like that. And they live off their trust and all this stuff like that, this equity and wealth is passed down from generation to generation. And the same white people, you know what they do? They own charities. They contribute to groups like Black Lives Matter. They contribute to the NAACP. They have things like the Ford Foundation. They basically tell you that uh, uh, this. So therefore, they know they got all the real power. But they'll elect somebody like Barack Obama. Oh, see, we got a black president. That doesn't mean a goddamn thing in this world because they have all the wealth. They have all the money. They have all the power, okay, that control this country, that controls the world. The, the black man has nothing, right? So I'm saying like this, it's been 400 years. Do we want to spend the next 400 years with nothing? Or do we want to build, start and build our own land and build our own nation, build our stuff like that, where we have our own Carnegie's? We have our own Trumps. We have our own Warren Buffets. We could produce our own billionaires and millionaires and stuff like this. We could pr 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 produce our our, our 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 rich. Not not that's another thing. Black people don't understand. Just because a white person is rich, he's a millionaire and everything, don't mean they're smart. By no means, if you see a black man that's a billionaire, he's smart. You know, but you see white people, they got money passed down to them, and I've seen it. You know, I've seen it up close when I moved here. You have white people that got money, they own farms, they own this, they own businesses. I had a guy years ago, I was driving Uber, right? This guy and I, and I was about the same age, right? And he was saying, yeah, I get my license back in six months, right? And I said, yeah, I said, what happened? He goes, you got time? I said, we got a, little, a few miles, so tell me, I told, tell me the story. He said, man, I've been married three times, right? White boy. You know, you could tell, like, younger, good-looking, good -looking, white boy, spoiled, right? He said, my parent, family owns half of Portsmouth, Virginia. He said, my parents spoiled me. I had everything I want. I failed at businesses. I failed through my drugs, everything like that. I was just wild. He said, I got one last chance, right? And then uh, he says, I own an Amoco uh, transmission dealership, right? He said, yeah, I'm part owner. So in other words, basically, after all his failures and fuckery and everything like this, he still owns part owner of an Amco transmission dealership, right? A, 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 a transmission shop, right? He said, I'm a part owner, me and my partner, we're on that and everything like that together. That's what I do now. I'm, I'm a part owner of that. He said, I'll get my license back in six months. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going straight and everything. And then he told me, so, so what's your story? I said, sir, my friend, you know, I know you had hundreds of times to fuck up. He said, I said, told him, I said, I never, as a black man, didn't have one chance to fuck up. 
I didn't have millions of dollars and parents and everything bailing me out of the court, bailing me out of this and everything, and talking to the judge and all stuff like that, putting me in these bullshit rehabs and everything and everything, and I'm fucking up constantly. Back in front of the judge all the time, you fucked up again and everything. This time you're doing 20 years and he get, he gets spared and spared and spared. I said, I didn't give this system one time to destroy me because it's not my system. I said, this. I told him, this is your system. This is your world to fuck up in. I'm saying to myself, why can't I, where, where, where's a black man's world there where a black man maybe have the same uh, benefit of the doubt? Oh, he's a good boy and everything like that. It does not exist anywhere on this planet because this is their world. This is their world. This is America. This is their world. I've known this my whole life. There's a privilege of being white and of being a white male. And the bottom line is no matter how much talk you talk about it, you can get on a view and talk about it. You can make movies and talk about it. You can get up with your social justice work. It doesn't mean a damn thing as long as this country is, is what it is. It's time for the black man in the world, to America, to say, I need, I'm a man and I deserve a man's chance in this world. I don't deserve crumbs from your table. I'm not gonna be Jay-Z asking for a fucking 2% of the damn NFL. And we want to own anything. We want to own the whole fucking thing. We want to own the whole goddamn uh, league. We want to own everything. This is what, when, when you talk about the Africans, then, we're talking about an area where we're going to control everything, where the wealth of the black race is going to be concentrated in our own banks, our own everything that we have, our own infrastructure, our own global supply chains. You know, this is what we're talking about. Before you can talk about the Africans, then, you got to have the, the mind here. If you think you're going to freaking be liberated inside the borders of America, you are crazy. Malcolm X always said, he said, any, any movement uh, for the liberation of black people based solely in America is doomed to fail. As long as you're in America. See, when you talk about uh, this, when I talk to a lot of white supremacists and everything, when I used to talk to these people back in the days, and, and me and my brother David hit, they, they called into a line on Skype uh, thing. And they said, oh, yeah, you black people. I said, well, when they found out that we were talking about building a nation on the African continent, they're like, oh, so you talk about uh, parting ways with America? Yeah. Yeah. This is real. See, if someone's not talking about parting ways with America eventually, they're not, they're not, they're not serious to you. It's time for a strategic divorce. Now, I know we can't do this overnight. It may take us 50 years. But we have to start the process, right? When we start building communities in Africa, right? When we start negotiating for territory for this Africa stand, and the, the guy or Nye asked a question, hold on. The bottom line is this. When we talk about a, a territory, right? You have territory, and, and obviously this guy never, I, think, I would like to, this guy Nye, the, the side with it is called in, I want you to call in tonight. I want you to call in tonight. I'm sick of these cowards in these chat rooms talking smack. And everything like that. If you really want to know what the average stands like, I will accept intelligent debate. I want to accept intelligent discussion about it, right? But what I'm not going to do is sit here and listen to a bunch of nonsense that I hear on YouTube all the time that I'm tired of hearing about, right? You can't tell me any logical reason why there's uh, the, uh, and we're going to talk about it tonight. Why is Cairo building a new city in the desert? Why is it that, uh, 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 South Korea is building a new uh, uh, city that's going to bring in Vietnamese professionals, Thai professionals, Japanese professionals, all in a new fusion uh, 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 mega city. Why is it that the black race, the whole thing is this, these people that want to rule over us and everything, the deal breaker is we basically, of the uh, African American slave center, we will govern ourselves. We will create our own government. You guys got enough. You got uh, 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 we, we, also what's up with sovereignty? First of all, he says sovereignty, right? What we're what we're proposing, right, is not automatic sovereignty. That's another thing. Who's sovereign? We know that's not going to happen overnight, but we do know if when we start building our black star communities all over the continent, eventually when we have enough that we want a autonomy at least, right? Can we agree with that? And we build a territory and everything, and we're the majority and everything. Shouldn't we basically be able to form our own government like everybody else in the world? Everybody else in the world, when they have some place that they uh, uh, occupy, they form their own government. Government is what? For the general well-being of the people. These people don't even want to talk about people from the diaspora governing themselves. So in other words, basically, you guys have your little towns and villages. And you got your voice to say so and everything. But when it comes to us and whatnot, you don't want us to have anything. 
You just want to be, basically be able to bring us to the continent and bleed us dry and shit, and we have nothing. You know, no, it's time for us. We're saying that we can bring the strength of the black or race of, uh, uh, to the African continent, but it has to be done this, you know? So, so uh, uh, yeah, being built by the Egyptian government, right? But a host country, right, can build a city for us, and who's even going to buy it? We have the means to buy uh, to buy the land and buy the real estate and develop it. So whatever host country we build this with will be a win-win situation, wouldn't it be? Wouldn't we be, wouldn't we be splitting the taxes that, that the city state, the uh, the nation state, the African generate with the host country for the for foreseeable future? And wouldn't we be buying electricity, you know? Oh, we don't want to oh, forget about Nigeria. Oh, take that up there. We, there's no, there's no, no, Nigeria, no, no. That, uh, Bumani, no. Nigeria, no. Nobody, nobody's talking about Nigeria. Don't worry, bro. Nobody, we don't even, I don't even want to go to Nigeria to visit. You know, that, that's not even, that's not even on the radar. But we are talking about countries like the Congo. We're talking about Angola because I've got Angolans on board with this. They're saying, yeah, we got plenty of territory. Uh, and, uh, hey, Bumani, do you want to put that picture up I sent you of the territory in northern Angola? Uh, yes, uh, resend it to me, uh, please. Um, yeah, um, so, so we're talking. talking about, I'll look for it. Uh, the bottom you... line, the bottom line is this: that area is called Soyo in northern Angola is is is, is a Bowman town. But the thing is, it's not like we're going to take over the area. But if we start building our own communities there, right? Eventually, it'll become its own district. To me, an Afrikan does not have to be sovereign initially, but it does mean that we have political political power and, and 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 we have our own right to uh uh dominion you know that's powerful currently we don't have that we have the right to municipality and dominion and therefore if we build stuff like that we are basically uh ha or be in a geopolitical position now alter the whole entire african uh, uh thing where you have these things just like dubai Dubai is part of the United Arab Emirates, but you wouldn't think so. The way it operates so independently, you know, you know, you got uh, 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 new cities uh, being built in Pakistan, you know, and the way they build these cities, right? You got professionals from all over the freaking world that do business, offshore banking, everything like this. Why is it that the African mind can't see this 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 benefit? I don't understand this. Africa is the only continent that's not developing on this level. Do you understand China and all these places, Thailand produce a billionaires every day? You know, they produce, I mean, stuff that I mean, so stuff that we use. I'm like, damn, I didn't know that was a Chinese company. You know, that control world markets. Why? Because they have a base to fight in. These Chinese people, same Chinese that become a billionaire could never do this inside the United States. But they, they have China as a base to operate out of. So we're talking about building a place where people can settle. Uh, and build and everything, and you're building uh, infrastructure, you're bringing taxes, you're bringing revenue, you're bringing expertise and everything. The biggest uh, competition in the future is not going to be for natural resources. Africans don't understand. It's not natural resources. It's going to be human resources. The hoarding of human resources is going to be most vital. Right now, Africa has a net loss of human capital. That means more people with engineering degrees or, or potential workers, whatever, or skilled labor leave the continent. You know, so therefore the continent cannot develop. That's why you got millions and millions of people walking around the continent with nothing to do. You got young men who are becoming older men. You look at the conflict that's going on in Congo right now where they're lashing out the UN trucks. Right now they're lashing out everything in sight. You got the SARS movement two years ago, two years ago in Nigeria. People are lashing out. Why? Because the people who, uh, instead of getting on here and saying, you know, Kyle, that's a good idea, right away, oh, you can't do that in Africa. This is what I'm talking about. So, Sai, whoever your name is, right? if you're not a Pan-African, if you're not looking at this Pan, why are you on this platform? Why are you here? You know, I would like for you to call in and explain yourself. You can't see that the future of the black race is not going to live unless we do this Africa thing. 
if, there, if there's not going to be that one place where the African diaspora can live and thrive and build and everything or off the shores of America and North America, somebody from Trinidad that might be a nuclear physicist, right? And somebody from uh, 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 from Canada, somebody from Idaho can all be in one place and everything on a different, a higher level. So when you talk about, oh, yeah, but, but, but when we talk about Africa, it's always mediocrity. You know, I like the African drums and everything like that. I eat my food food with Joe Love rice. I love all that stuff. But that's not what's going to save us. You know, arguing about Burner Boy and Afrobeats getting into the Grammys, which you guys are concerned about right now. Afrobeats is not in the Grammys. It should be its own category. If that's what's important to you, I'm sorry. It's not important to me. Having an African stand is important because you have the strongest group of black people on the planet, you know, that's proven. You know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that it is capable of doing this. We did it before at Liberia. You know, we built Black Wall Street in America. We built all these things. If it wasn't for the African American, there would be no automobile industry. There would be no steel industry. There would be no longshoremen. Everything you see in America is because of the black man in America. It's our labor and our work and our ingenuity that we contributed to it. We're saying that if we had that one state, right? Which we could be, and also let me tell you the benefits uh, of an African stand to the African continent. What do you think we would get most of our food, rice, and stuff like that? Who would benefit from that? Wouldn't it be our African neighbors? People don't even think this is what I'm talking about. This is what I mean by, by my an intelligent conversation. An intelligent person would say, you know something? If uh, an Angolan would look at it and say, you know something? When you built that city state, man. And I got a business that I make car tires, I make car parts, or whatnot. Jeez, man, these guys. I could have a new line of customers. Or if you have a farm, uh, that uh, a commercial farm in Nigeria, you say, you know, you know, something, you know something? I could probably go over there and fucking make a million dollars in one week selling to them. What, but the African black mind does not think on that level. Right now, when they're starting to build smart cities, let's say in Egypt, I'm sure there's some people in the area saying, you know something, you know, they're coming to our tribal land. But hey, that city's there, man. That might be some opportunity. I could sell. Egypt is a huge place of cattle. People don't realize that Egypt is one of the world producer of cattle. Oh, geez, maybe I, I, maybe my beef industry might explode. I have new customers. You see, but my, you see the, the the mentality of the uh, the uh, the uh, other my, people's mind and the black mind. The black star pan African community. Once it gets a few thousand references, what do you think they're going to get most of their uh, stuff in their market on the local people? Wouldn't the local people benefit from the uh, uh, the increase in commerce and trade and, and stuff like this? If we built a hospital clinic and all this stuff like that, wouldn't the local people benefit from having a, a medical system established and everything? You know? Absolutely, brother. The thing of it is, when those of us are moving and making these moves... Also, happen, also, let me ask you, he goes, he goes, if you have a... You could build a city, have political power... But have a gov set. What do you What do you mean by that? You know, isn't New York City separate a government inside a, new, a state of New York? I mean, this is what I'm. This see see what I'm talking. Do you see what I'm talking about, uh, Bamani? These guys, the African mind, right, does not see anything other than this. You know. Uh, well, Liberia is is part of the Africa, but like that. But Liberia, you know, has a lot of problems, right? As far as that, we need a host country that can really support this. A country that that could invest in this and stuff like this. Liberia is definitely a part of what we're talking about. Had the 1980 coup not happened, yeah, Liberia, we wouldn't be talking about this. We'd be settling Liberia right now. But but right now, Liberia has a lot of problems, a lot of issues, and everything like that is 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 issue. Like we basically have to tell Liberia's story. Liberia has not told its story for the last 50 years, so therefore we're starting from scratch with Liberia. Liberia is one thing, right? The Africa stands another thing. Liberia is just like uh, Ghana, right? We go to Ghana, we build in Ghana and everything. We go to Gambia, we build in Gambia and everything like that. We talk about an African stand. We're talking about a whole new thing. You know, a whole new thing. So once we have that territory, right, and we build our own communities on there, and we basically uh, incorporate, we have our own uh, militia and uh, uh, military and uh, police and stuff like this. And we control the autonomy and sovereignty. It could be a win-win situation for the host country. And also look at the model, the Vatican. The Vatican has its own government and infrastructure, 
but it's still part of the country of Italy. But it operates as a separate entity. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, this has been done all over the world. You know, the whole idea is, like I said, we have a mentality where before we even said, instead of saying, you know something, let's build the Africa in and let's find out afterwards whether we're going to be part of this or not. At least China was smart enough to let Taiwan develop first, right, before it starts talking about one China policy. If China was talking about one policy like 50 years ago, you think Taiwan would develop? No, everybody else said, forget this. But at least they let them develop, right? You know, and the days of the showdown is going to come, you know. You know, okay, let me read this. Would Africa be a black American nation or black race? It's the Africa means African American primarily and African uh, slave descendant. I consider Bomani, Jamaican, and African American, African diaspora the same thing. I don't make a friggin' distinction between black America and if you're a black person of slave descent, of uh, you know who I'm talking about. The people I'm talking to know who I'm talking about. The people who are landless, the people who yeah, do not. Uh, and most, stop. Of us, most of us come from the Americas, whether it's from North, Central, South. North, Central, South if you come from the Americas, Americas you know? right? I you guess saying, not, 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 right? Not, not specifically to the which, the, the, now, which the is, which is a major part of the African diaspora. Right. We're talking about people from Canada. You know who you are. You know, if your ass has been getting kicked for 400 years, you're part of it. You know what I'm saying? You know, if you're homeless, if you, if you, if, if, you know how you give the, the test, right? If you uh, 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 see slave, uh, watch a slave movie, and and uh, let's say you watch 12 Years a Slave, if you walk out of the theater and you want to punch a white person in the freaking head, you're one of us, right? If you watch uh, 12 Years a Slave and you keep talking about how great the white people are and stuff like that, you're probably a Negro pen and get the fuck away from us. You know, as simple as that. You know? You know? So, uh, so Nye, uh, you're, uh, you're, which we call, you're, uh, which we call the Angolan, how, who are you to tell the Angolan government what to do? You know, the Angolan government says, you know something, you guys can govern yourselves. The Angolan has different provinces. Is that a separate government? You know, separate. See, people. Are, Angola has an area right now, Bomani, called Cabinda. That's supposed to be part of Angola, but they self-govern it. And Cabinda has oil. Angola has never basically went over. Cabinda is on the Congo, uh, is north of the Congo River, right? P folks, I've been doing my homework and studying this for twenty years. I know what I'm talking about. The Angolan government. I talked to Angolan government officials, and they tell me, you know something? I don't know why you guys haven't done this years ago. And the biggest problem with Angola is the language barrier. That's I, that's the problem. And I talked to Angolans, and they're like, "Man, if you guys build a city, stay a smart city, and we they would they would say, you know something, that would answer to all our prayers. We will have access to uh, black people in America. Angola would love to be where Ghana is right now with Black America, but there's a language barrier. Such an African stand would connect the uh, Angola with every aspect of the diaspora, from Cuba to America." But Monty, am I talking Greek? Do, do, am I making sense here? Yes, brother, you're making absolute sense, brother. That's how yeah, we do it. Am I? Uh, 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 what you call it? But my group of yeah, but Monty and group. That's one part of it, but it doesn't end right there. It's a foundation. That's a foundation. You know, I'm all with but my group. That that's a foundation. But as soon as yeah, enough of them, ways to go. you got you going to want to have political. But what's this idea that Africans don't want nobody to have political? Africans are always trying to suppress other people. They use the numbers and fiat and tribalism. Oh, you can't have no political power. Look, the bottom line is this. This is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about right here. Nigeria, right? Instead of Nigeria focusing on the Royal Dutch Shell and Shell and everything and nationalizing the oil industry and taking that shit back and kicking the Queen of England the fuck out of there, right? They're worried about, oh, you might have some power. You don't have power over your own fucking country. You know, instead of Nigeria say, you know, something got a uh, 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 legal dang attack, given that he's building an oil refinery and stuff like this. Let's make sure every Nigerian has infrastructure. Let them have running water, electricity. Less than 10 percent of Nigerians live on the grid. You know, you got people in Makoto still living like a friggin living abysmal. You know. 
You know, and so it's a federal thing. A fe you know, first of all, in America, each state has their own uh, national guard, don't we, Bamani? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. State America has their own national guard. National guard, that is. It's, uh, it's a, it's a, each state has only. It's why? Because that actually makes the state stronger. If the African was able to protect and patrol itself, it even uh, 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 the only thing I don't think is um, uh, we have a coastal police and everything, but there's, the federal government is responsible for the Coast Guard, right? But uh, but we still have every state and city has their own coastal uh, police patrol, shore patrol, and stuff like that, because the federal government can't be every place. So what we're talking about is this, is this, and I'm glad this guy's talking. Because this is the hard reality of nation building. It's not pretty. It's not fun. It's not sexy. You know? The reality is this. Yes, if we're at the uh, uh, Congo River mouth, right, building a settlement, we got we're going to be responsible for patrolling. We're going to be responsible for uh, uh, stopping smuggling, stopping human trafficking. Who's going to do that? The Angolan government is not going to uh, do, all, do all those things. We're going to have to do that. We're going to be responsible for it. You know, no, because they just said people side living in the jungle. No, people, you have billions of dollars, right? In Nigeria, every Nigeria's always bragging about the billionaires they got, and you got people living like that. We, as our value system, is we don't care what you're trying, you're not going to live like that. That's what the African stands for. Everyone's going to have a basic standard of living, a basic standard of living. The base, we're going to provide you with the basics, you know. Yeah, so 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 it's also it's almost like our local regional government. I mean, that's not too that's not too hard to think. The host country is going to benefit. It's a win-win situation. You're bringing in uh, tourism dollars and the billions of dollars. You're bringing in uh, brain power, brain trust. You're competing for human capital and engineering and everything. It's going to bring that light to that country, that region. That's sitting there doing nothing. The same unoccupied, undeveloped, sitting there doing nothing. See any see any other group of people, race of people, right? You got two hundred million people living in the West. They would have figured out a way how to uh, capitalize on bringing people home. It would have been done. Every city, every country on the coast of Africa should have an African city. Cameroon should have one. You know, Ghana should have one. You know, all the places where black people were like should have a city. Uh, territory said so that would be bring billions of dollars in investment to the continent you know that would create the biggest real estate boom in history you got people 200 million people uh 45 million people 50 uh, in, in north america along almost 60 million people from the first world from the industrialized world basically and you got billions millions of black people retiring that means people who have 401ks and pensions and everything that can roll over. Right now, you know who's taking advantage of his Angola? The Portuguese. There's 200,000 Portuguese uh, retiring going to Angola because it's cheaper and better. They're doing what we're doing. And I got to get lit from people talking about, why are you guys doing this? Angola has built a, 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 a Kalunda, a, 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 a city that's empty right now. The Angola don't have, can't move the people there. But if you got people coming from the West, from Brazil, well, maybe not Brazil, but uh, uh, middle-income countries like Trinidad and Panama to, to buy a land and be part of our African program, hang on with boom. And then from that, right, the wealth that you create from that, right, you can basically give money to help the local Angolans who can't afford like that. It's a win-win situation. It's all about us finally being globally interconnected. We're living in a global world, but the only group of people when it comes to globalism, right? It's well, global is all right when the Chinese and everybody else is flooding into America. Flood, oh, it's globalism. But as soon as a black man in America says, you know something, I want to be global too. Let's start building something. Oh, no. You got guys like Afro dumbass on there talking about, oh, we're colonizing Africa, the colonization of Africa. How the hell am I going to colonize something that's already fucking mine? Yeah, brother. Uh, actually, uh, seriously, brother, let's talk about people like like that because you have a lot of uh, unintelligent people out there and you know, call themselves all these uh, names, making it seem like they're sophisticated and they're intelligent. 
These are people who have no experience in Africa, no experience researching out there doing anything. And they literally, like I mentioned to you, they're spectators and commentators. That's all they do. Yeah, that's all we do. That's all they do. That's what we call them on, uh, you know, online nowadays, the trolls. <laughs> yeah, troll. All they do is troll. Or, 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 or shit-talking punks. Yeah, check this out. The bottom line is this. No, and I, also, but I mean, we haven't really talked about it. Like, just like you and I, you and I ran the um, unapologetic Negro Pian off YouTube. Yeah, he's okay. done. He decided to get a real job. Well, I don't know if you got a real job. I mean, you know, if you if your wife is a porn star, you can just make some money. Yeah, yeah we're living right. off that porn star money, you know. And so the bottom line is, oh, troll! What he did was, I told him, "You're making a big mistake going after Bamani." So he just got yeah. so comfortable. Hey, bro, that, that, that was the, that was the end of his career. That was the end of him, man. It was like, damn. It's kind of like one of these fake ass rappers going off to, going after a legend. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, what, well, when he when, you know, when he said when he said, "Oh, Bomani, as soon as he uh, gets to Africa, then you have people in there, same people that be in Dynasty's chat room. Hey, Dynasty, hey, bro, Brandon, and everything in the chat room talking about, oh man, I can't wait to see Bomani in chains getting locked up in one of that same fucking sellout motherfuckers, uh, two fist motherfuckers. We don't know who these people are that be on these show these uh, these chat room stuff. You know, yeah, I, absolutely. One thing about me, uh, you know, family, you know. You know, you you like the the the, the gifted uh, gifted uh, person that the ancestors blessed to you know to to take on the challenge of this work because it's serious work. So I laugh at the people that be coming at me. I'm like, you come at me strong, you know, whatever. Because at the end of the day, people are gonna have to follow the works. What are you doing for black people? What are you doing for changing their lives? What are you impacting? What are you actually doing, you know, beyond just criticizing, like I mentioned, spectating and commentating, just living this uh, right. on the sideline, play hating. But like me and my homie always talk about, man, that's what haters do. They go hate. And that's what that unapologetic Negro Pian is about. You know, he's, you know, he's a hater that's going to hate because he can't do what I do and he can't live in our community because we don't accept swirlers in our community. So, yeah, no LGBTQ, no swirlers. Get the fuck out of here. With you, know, you know, and I'm saying we are who we are. You know, what I'm saying just like you see it on a shirt, Africa for the Africans. It's a pan African operation. You know, so let mean? me let me let me talk about this. Right, there's been a, a couple in Ghana is, like, since they since they basically took shots at you. Let's talk about them, right? Yeah, let's talk about them. I mean, let's I mean, talk about this. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Ghana, uh, 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 what's it called? For, well, I forgot the name of it, uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, it, it, it don't matter, you know. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, they say well, anyway, uh, uh, they basically was taking shots, talk about you shouldn't build your own community in Ghana, right? So in other words, basically uh, taking shots of Bomani, you know, <laughs> while you living off YouTube views and stuff like that. And then now, now they're saying they're bringing white people over with them. What now? Oh, we got interracial couples and whatnot. So in other words, basically we go from America to get away from that, right? You know, Absolutely, so, bro. If, if, if I look, look, I know white people in America, you know, this that your thing, but I don't want to see them in Africa, you know. <laughs> you right. know, I go, I, this is when I talk about Africa, I'm getting with people. This is black as we can get this. I realize that my business on that, you got to deal with people of different races. I get that, you know, right. but you guys want to bring, uh, 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 bring, remember the one video where the guy was talking, uh, and he had a, uh, there was a black girl, a Ghanaian girl, in the background, there was a white guy. To talking to a white boy, so this yeah. is what is. The, the bottom line: they hate people like Brother Bomani and myself and whatnot, right? Because we're not about that life, you know. You want to go to Ghana because you want to bring your LGBT. If you're a black guy, you want to bring your black boyfriend. They got this guy that you know, the guy they beat up in uh, Rwanda. He took the video down. Now he's over in uh, thing. I forgot his name. You know, he just uh, gay, and flaming, and everything. Got the silver hair. <laughs> Everything, yo. These people. Let me tell you something. These people are not with the BAIO. They're not with Africa for Africa. Brother Bomani. They're not with us, right? Because we know our ultimate goal is nation building. And we, you know, what's a nation? You know, what a family is? Like in the words of great Vladimir Putin, Mama and Papa. You know, <laughs> absolutely. You know? That's what Black Vladimir Putin said. Mama and Papa. We believe the bottom line is this. These people are. How are you gonna do this, Kyle? Well, first of all. And I'm gonna talk about something, right? I'm gonna talk about something, right? I believe, right, when when it comes down to this pioneer movement, right, we have to go as families, you know, and family units. Now, I understand people want to live the single life. I get that, you know, right? But when you talk about building a house in Africa and stuff like that, 
it got to be, you got to have that pioneering spirit. You got to have that spirit that we took to Oklahoma. You got to have that spirit that we took to Kansas, you know? You got to have that pioneering spirit that we made the journey to New York and whatnot. Those families living together and stuff like that. We got, if we get back to that, right, we'd be invincible. The most powerful, most threatening thing to America all time was always a black family. Absolutely. That's, you got to dissect it. And, you so know, the African stand, stand, the African stand loves, not only loves, but cherishes the black family. You know, yeah. absolutely. I mean, yeah, that's the foundation. But uh, I want you to hold for a few seconds. Let me uh, make sure you know, uh, you know, address what you talk about as far as building a community and those are uh, those the, that that couple on YouTube. Those, you know, what I mean that that you know, what I mean, and everybody have a right to their, you know, how they see things. I'm telling people, I personally have lived in the world of, you know, I'm 44, but you know, you know, I've been out here, in, out here, literally this in the, for the last 18 years. In Africa, in uh, Africa, consistently, and um, you see a lot of things that other people don't see. I see people who have known, who have destroyed their lives, moving to Africa. Period. <laughs> what it is, I'm not here to, to romanticize it. You know, we're building a community, so we're well invested, and we're also going to build a whole lot more in Liberia. Because I'm telling people that's our foundation country in Africa, mm -hmm. Liberia. Tourism, investment, citizenship, repatriation, nation building. All that good stuff, you know. What I mean, I'm even gonna click on the flyer again uh, while we're talking, you know, literally. But uh, at the same time, too, our uh, family. Um, then those of us that are in whatever country in Africa, the best thing that I'm recommending to you is to, you know, from the African diaspora, is to connect with your own brothers and sisters from the African diaspora, work with them, to organize to where you you connect your strength and numbers, and you look out for each other because the unfortunate situation that goes on, and it's what it is. I'm not here to. To you know, to put down, to say everyone in Africa is doing it because it's not. You know, what I mean, you know, it, it's it's a leech system to where someone from somewhere else comes, and you're supposed to be working and helping them, but instead of you working and helping them grow and build, so we can all eat, you're sucking them and sucking them, and the next you know they have nothing, and on the other end also they come and make bad decisions and make bad moves. So it's not like a you know, it's not like you know, you're not like blaming it on everyone or on one set of people. Now, so those of us who are making these moves, we have to be wise. You know what I mean? Because I've heard people say some ignorant, stupid stuff like, I'm going, to, you know, I, didn't, I didn't move to Africa to be around no African-American bad mistake. I didn't, you know, I'm going to, to live with the people. You know, you can live wherever you want to live with, whoever and things like that. But, you know, don't, don't, don't put it in a way like, oh, you're just going to, you know, that because what it is. They find out real quick. Yeah, they're gonna find out real quick. We live in a struggle here in in America, and you have you know you kind of like have certain things in common. And I look at what you can use to build your strength and numbers to where you can actually you know you you know you have a one common goal. You know you know because you, you're coming from an oppressed society and things like that. So it's easy for you to band together and say you know what uh, we're gonna work together. And that's all you're trying to do where you where you're going. And people, you know, you got to connect with the right people to where people understand you and we're working together on the same goal. Other than that, they're going to do AKA leech, suck, and take advantage of you. You know what I mean? Things like that. You may have an attorney that just collects money and don't represent your case. Uh, or people who do certain things that they're supposed to do. And I'm telling people, this is my experience. I've been through these things. I'm, I don't sit, I don't go around and just make up stories and or tell war stories. I'm not, you know, like, you know, like some fake rapper or something that just never live the life that you know he's talking about everything that we will always talk about is based on experience based on living in the world where it's us our partners our associates or understand africa now you know i don't think there's any other people really out there that can just explain it to you better about africa and how we should make it work so if you feel like you know us building a community you know it, you know is it's not something that you're feeling I'm saying to you honestly, that's your business. But that it, you know, you need to put your economic power together. You need to be wise when you're living there. Because I've seen too many people come back homeless. Too many people have nothing because they're doing what that couple is doing. So that couple that's making these videos, you know, they're very ignorant and they have no experience and they say a lot of things. You know, like I tell people, I'm not on YouTube trying to get no followers, no views, no income, no nothing. I'm here to educate our people. I'm here to show a life that we can live beyond, you know, what we thought we can live. 
based mm -hmm. on tourism investment, living and doing business in Africa. And, and we have helped a lot of people from you know over the last 15 years live, move, and set up and connected. And the people who follow our directions and follow or actually follow our consultation literally make it happen. And those who just feel like they can just go and do whatever, you don't understand this world that you're, you're moving into. You know, yeah. you're, you're coming with your entitlement of what you think Africa is and what Africa is, you know, it's how it works and it doesn't work that way. And that's why we have nothing but people on the ground in every country that I operate in. You know, and then, you know, I look for the best people I can work with. And those who don't, you know, operate correctly, I fire them, get rid of them. And we, you know, because at the end of the day, you want the best mindset that understand where you're coming from. And you see the shirt that we have. You see the name of our brand. It's Africa for the Africans. Our people, dear, whatever country we're doing business, at, always benefit. You know, the payout, everything is good. And the, the connections and the network is good. And it's a win-win situation. You know, and if we don't handle certain things in a certain way, you end up, feeling like you're just going to do charity and charity after charity after charity, you'd be homeless, broke, and have you know and starving. And bitter. You know, bitter, mad, frustrated, pissed off. Oh, then people in Africa did this and oh you know, and you know it's it's a mutual situation. But at the end of the day, you have to take accountability. Number one, don't run away from the struggle of the people you came from. If you you come from Jamaica, you come from, you know what I'm saying, here in you know whatever part of America or you come from, uh, you know, somewhere in in Europe. We're not fooling. In other words, in other words, we're not fooling. Look we're out for people. We you know work together. You know, and you know, and ultimately together, the goal is for us to connect together as a Pan African nation of people and compete with the rest of the world. Because as you talk about, brother, everywhere else is industrialized. And I was in the Navy in 1999. I won't say I was about 22 and something like that. Um, my numbers may be off a little bit, but it's definitely 1999. And when we talk about United Arab Emirates, been there in uh, Dubai, Bahrain, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the so-called Persian Gulf area, West Asia, you know, all these places got all these different names. Well, right in that area and been to many Asian countries, you know, from Singapore, Malaysia, Korea, Japan. And what you see is an incredible industrialization and advanced society. That was in 1999. And you saw competitive <coughs> people competing literally to make their nation great you know because you know you if you have the greatest competitive minds engineers scientists you know technicians and so on business people and you know you know your country grows and that's what that's what i saw so here we are in africa you know and here we are as a you know, black nation of people and you know we're still struggling to do all these things and everyone else has just evolved and, you know, it would be nice if uh, more African governments would just open up and say, yes, let the African diaspora come in and connect and, uh, you know, manage aspects of different things and give them the right and all these things. It would be nice, you know, but, the, the, you know, but the ego and the mindset and the, the level of just <laughs> jealousy and envy or whatever it could be. That's all it is. It's, it's jealousy. Uh, or the level of just envy. The, the colonized <laughs> mindset and everything. And not understanding who you're dealing with and who we are as a people. I mean, it's not I'm not saying it's one or one or the other family. I'm just, just putting out a bunch of things and saying that it could be many of these things. But the point of it is, it's not getting done, and that's what we need as a people. We need to be able to get access to where you know countries open it up to where citizenship. All that stuff is a little simpler. I mean, I understand you know I understand that you have to do what you have to do, but you know it's like how long should we wait? How long should we keep on this? You know, keep on doing what we're doing, which is coming. And spending lots of money in many countries, vacation mm. and tourism, and uh, you know, investing and so on, and things like that. it's not like you know, you're asking for a handout. So these are the diplomatic situations that I hope to where you and I can work together to achieve in Liberia from the mm -hmm. ground. Yeah. Because I do feel like it makes a difference from the ground up, and I'm coming with a strength of just experience as mm -hmm. a talk about. So um, and, you know, I learned a lot from this being there in Ghana doing business. And I tell people, we'll keep on doing what we're doing nonstop. I mean, it's just we're, we're, we're expanded. And, and, uh, and um, Liberia is an incredible. Yeah, Liberia is going to be the place where where, where, where the, the Africa stands going to be brokered. You know, I want I want I want us to build Africa, African BAO headquarters in Liberia. Right. Build that there and be a thing where. I already talked to my Angolan partners. I said, look, uh, I need you guys to come to Liberia next summer. You know, I haven't got a response. I sent them a long letter. I said, I need you guys to join us next year in Liberia. You know, join us on this tour. 
The Angola, these Angolans got money, the government officials, everything. I said, come to Liberia. I said, the, the whole thing is having a base in Africa so we can negotiate. Now, the Africa set is long term. That's long term. You know, when that's completed, we probably won't even be alive, you know. But that's what we're going towards by building in Africa, by building communities, by doing investments and stuff like that, major investments and showing Africa that we are serious about settling on the continent and building and stuff like this. Then they'll they'll take us uh, uh, seriously. You know, here's the problem. I looked at what's going on in Gambia. Every last single expat in Gambia does not talk is at each other's throats. That's embarrassing. And you got Afro dumbass. He's sitting there celebrating all these African Americans. Look, see the bag that said this about him, and <laughs> other guys. They all been going on his this stupid Negro European show, trying to tell on each other and everything, like he's somebody important. So the problem is this. Here's the problem. Right? Here's the problem. See, if you are doing everything right, and I know understand like this, like I said, when you basically have uh, put something out there, that's why I said I don't put anything out there, right? So we're gonna like I said, I'm just on, I, I, I know I got context. I have ideas, right? I have nothing solid yet, right? So I'm not gonna tell you anything, right? But when you get on YouTube, right, and you're feeling yourself a little bit and say you got this and you got that and everything, and people remember what you said. And then you got to try to play catch up and try to cover one lie and everything. And that's what's happening. And so, therefore, what's happening is this. People are trying to save their own necks. They know they did wrong. They know they fucked up with somebody's money. They know everything ain't right. We, 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 you can see it. They may have been on. That don't mean they're bad people. But the bottom line is when you're talking about this situation, you know, sometimes things just don't work out. And you blow through somebody's money and whatever. And then uh, you're out there and you're on the hook because you made yourself public. You put you went on YouTube. You, you said, I'm going to do this and everything. And then when it doesn't work out, people don't come after you. And so therefore, you got enemies sitting in the wing talking about, see, this is what these diasporans are doing. This is what these African-Americans are doing and everything. And then you're basically saying to everybody that's not doing that, right, say, well, I ain't me. Instead of them coming to the fence saying, look, we can vouch for this person, you know? Yeah, we have like that, but that's no reason. That's what Indians do. You can't pick the Indian community apart and make them put them against each other. You can't even pick, you can't even in Nigeria, much dirt Nigerians do in America, you can't get Nigerians to throw another Nigerian under the bus. They stick together. Same thing with Ghanaians. But what is it about African Americans and African diasporas, right? You get to Africa and everybody's at each other's throats. Everybody's trying to undermine. Why would somebody take a shot at Bamani talking about why you building a community? Why is that? We didn't start this. You know, this couple started that, you know. Now, why? Because somebody basically who seen Bomani, see what he's doing, went to them and say, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? You know, or it could be a white person, for all we know. Is there a lot so of jealous people out there, brother, jealous because they can't do what we do and they're not going to be able to just build what we're building and we're going to dominate and be right. very impactful. Right. So what we're doing in Ghana is like that. And also we're going to build a pan-African black side in, Ghana, in, every, in every country we're going to have one. And the, the crowning achievement was when we finally make it down from Liberia to Angola and we build these pads. Once we once we start building, get the momentum and everybody, and this becomes a multi-billion dollar operation or not, we're able to build smart cities like and not where we're, we're just like that, that like that. When this really blows up and everything, we're gonna be able to build these these communities, these prototype uh, satellite communities all over the continent, you know? And so what are you gonna say? They each one is gonna have their own stock exchange. They're going to have their own uh, core central banks, their own everything, and it's going to have their own uh, infrastructure. Now, let's talk about infrastructure, right? Infrastructure, there's two types of infrastructure. There's hard infrastructure, and then there's soft, what I call soft essential infrastructure, okay? Now, the hard infrastructure should be supplied by the host country, okay? Well, Colin, what do you mean by that? What, what do you mean by the host, uh, hard infrastructure? Your railways. You're connected. You should be able to be connected to the host country's major ports, cities, airports, okay, and all these things. Until you reach a certain population, and everything where you could justify building your own airport, building your own railway uh, uh, terminals and uh, railway yards, and everything. Initially, you don't need all that. Just like initially, Texas didn't need a lot, you know, but as it, it grows. And you projections, and that's where your engineers and your logistics analysts come in, you know. 
and they decide, okay, if the population grows here and everything like that. See, the whole thing is this. Once we have uh, uh, the right, we have, we have to have our own version of Halliburton and stuff like that that does global logistics. All these things I'm presenting to you folks is the reason why you should join the BAIO, join Brother Bamani, because the time's going to come. Who do you think is going uh, to do this? Nobody's going to do this with us. And the whole thing is I'm trying to tell people hey, look, it's opportunity. It's opportunity. Nobody else is doing this. Nobody has the will to do this but Collagenesis. Everybody else is pussyfooting around this idea of an African or nation state or city state or autonomous territory. It doesn't have to be sovereign, you know, an autonomous territory. If we're basically inside of, let's say, the Congo or whatever like that, and we got an autonomous territory, that's all we freaking need. Because, uh, which we call, um, well, uh, uh, yeah, well, the, the the people that left the BAO, those are a few people and a bunch of big mouths and whatnot because I didn't agree with the LGBTQ and all this kind of friggin' Marxist crap they were talking and everything. So they went their own way. Good luck to them, you know. But when you talk about who's actually going to do this, who has a will, the strength to carry this out, you know what group is going to be able to do this. What group does Brother Bomani rock with? It sure ain't the other guy, you know. It sure ain't the other guy. So what I'm talking about is this hard infrastructure, right, which is to be provided by the host country, right? The host country benefits, right? Because when you build infrastructure, right, you build what we call a grid. You're part of the grid, right? Then uh, 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 I'll answer that, you know, about nation building. I'm not going to knock the nation of Islam, right? The nation of Islam is, as far as like nation building right as far as like now i'm talking about the african is a nation state that means a nation now as far as like nation the nation of islam taught us family values everything like that those are essential in building a nation of the, as a, a state but it's never been put to the test because it was operating inside of america and also the nation of islam never did like the hasidic community the Hasidic community got communities all over america independent communities same thing with the uh, the Amish in upstate New York, Pennsylvania. We got Amish communities, right? They're separatists. They don't salute the American flag. The Amish. Everybody knows that. The separatists, all kinds of separatist communities in America. The Nation of Islam calls them a separate community, but they should have been building their own communes and little towns and stuff like that and everything. Say we're the Nation of Islam, you know, inside of America. That would have worked. They never did that. They never graduated to that point. So therefore, as far as like. What they believe is family and marriage, everything. There's nobody better teacher of how to build, uh, how to, what to do about your wife in the nation of Islam. That I give them. So let's not knock the nation of Islam, because if it wasn't for me, nation of Farrakhan, I probably wouldn't be here right now. I heard Farrakhan speak one night, and I said, you know something. By the time I was in my knucklehead years and one night, when I was about to get into the street life, when I heard Minister Farrakhan speak, you know, and he spoke to me. That you're something you're gonna be you're gonna do something great one day. Don't throw your life away. Now listen to that. So I'm not gonna never knock uh, Minister Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. I don't agree with anything they say and everything. This is something different. That we don't have to be enemies and whatnot with the Nation of Islam. You know, you know. Then that those are not my enemies. Those are my brothers. You know, and I consider Minister Farrakhan my father. You know, a father figure. You know, do I agree with him? No, I'm a little different you know but i'll never disrespect somebody like that you know it's a minister paragon never will you know so i what like i said i would love to have the nation of islam blessings in this you know and uh, what i'm doing you know stuff like that so i would love to for that you know i need all the help i can get i'm gonna need the people who are real nationalists you know i want to be i want i want the bao to be an umbrella of nationalist people the ultimate goal is we're building communities in America, in Africa, and the end game is a nation state of our own. Now, this nation state doesn't have to be sovereign. We could come under the sovereignty of a host country. You know what I'm saying? When a country's sovereign, you know how beautiful it is? That means you can carry their passport. That means that you could uh, have an office, your, uh, the African state could have an office in their, uh, in, in their um, all the embassies, a consulate. So in other words, the African Consulate in Moscow from the, under the government of Angola 
know what I'm saying? They have, they have the embassy, right? And then we have our own council. That's how it usually works. Some states in America have their own consulate now because states, remember something, uh, America, when it was first founded, written, right, was probably, uh, uh, what, 8 million people? America's infrastructure and everything was probably smaller than the state of Connecticut at the time. But it's grown so much massively, right? You still got the Constitution. Now, these states, right, can function like the United States did when it first started. Now, Amer Amer America's states are becoming more global. Texas businessmen, uh, uh, Emron, all that, they're global. You know, California is becoming global. So therefore, yeah, they understand, you know, even though they're still, we're still sovereign inside the United States and everything, these states have developed to the point where they can operate as, as their own nations almost. Now, sovereignty, as far as like, you can't restrict people from moving there from border to border, but this is being tested in the United States right now. Where Texas is now taking these people that are breaking across the border because the Biden administration doesn't want to protect the borders, and they're shipping them to D.C. and New York. So how do you like that? New York said, "Oh, we don't want these people." Well, we've Texas like we don't want them. So therefore, a part of a nation state, a territory, is borders, you know, and boundaries. You know, you have to have defined bound and jurisdictions. Right now, uh, the 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 black man in the West who wants to return to Africa has no no boundaries, no jurisdiction. We have to have some sort of jurisdiction we have to have something that says okay on past this line we'll take it from here our police our uh, security forces we'll take it from here we have to have so, that sort of autonomy or it's a deal breaker you know if something happens with the host country you know, political turmoil we'll be safe we have to start thinking also another thing is too is this when i'm seeing in africa right what I saw with the arrivals, right, getting their family broken into because there wasn't strong enough. There's enough black people from America in the diaspora over there. How come basically we don't have night patrols checking it up on people, watching property at night and stuff like this? Well, bringing cowards and wimpy. We're still trying to, I just want to be part of the local. And you can't do that. It doesn't work like that. When you move to, from, let me give you an example. When I moved from New York to Virginia, I tell you that, I couldn't just go into any hood and just, just do what the hell I want. And that, these are people all African Americans. I have to learn people. I have to know where to, to move and everything. If I have to do that in America, what do you think it's gonna be like that in Africa? I got with also I, when I came down to Virginia, I got with people from New York. I to this day, all these years I've been here, almost everybody I know I'm friends with are from New York or New Jersey. Because down here, the black people down here. If you don't know them from, from kindergarten, you ain't never going to be part of them. You weren't born here. That's just human nature, human life. You got to accept that. And too many people, I believe, in the Pan-African movement really never had a sense of community. They never had any place. They're always yearning and searching for something and everything. And they've never been, they, they, feel like they, they seem like they're oddballs in their own community in America, right? And they go to Africa and they want this acceptance and everything, right? You can't if you can't accept yourself first, right? And know who you are first, right? You understand who you are, you're all right, right? You're never going to be accepted by something. People could sense when you're lost and you're just defeated and hopeless. You don't want to project that on the people. We want to be a people that say, look, I have a right to be in the Gambia. This is my land. This is my ancestral land. I can trace my ancestral land here. I have a right to return here. Sure, I talk differently and everything, but I'm here. If you can accept all these white people out here that's molesting boys and buying an old white, old raggedy ass white women coming here uh, on sex tours and everything, and you can accept me here having a home and building a community for my people. That's just justice. And before we go any further, we have to we have to do it like that. And I'm saying to myself this: a lot of black people who go to Africa, right? They never talk about the stuff like this. So, so either I, I'm willing to think that the fact that either it doesn't bother you when you see Europeans sitting there with uh, African children on your lap or you're participating in it. One for, thing for sure is I don't condone it like that. And part of me is going to say something about it. Now, if you uh, in the area that we could control and areas that are around our communities and everything, that's not going to happen. You know, that's not going to happen. Don't mean we're going to be lawless, but we're going to, and we are the ones that's 
policing and stuff like that, you know, it's not going to end well for these people. So, so I, like I said, it's the all, it's all about mutual respect. It's all about mutual respect. There's certain things that we want. There's certain things that they want. There's some things that we tolerate and say, this is acceptable in our culture and everything. If you want to add to our culture and add to what we're trying to do and everything, if you can show me, fuse your African culture into what we, we can meet middle ways and everything, that's fine. But we're not going to go backwards, you know, for anybody. We're not going to say, oh, it's done in Africa. I don't care. There's a lot of things in Africa that that's done that I don't, we don't accept. Not saying we're better, but we're just different. And that difference is this. If you guys, you have millions of Chinese who hate you. There was a Chinese guy who was making pictures of Malawi, uh, postcards of Af innocent African children, making them say they were ugly monsters and all stuff like this, you know. And the Africans let this go on. There's never been any situation where anybody knows where African Americans have done anything harm to African children and everything. We've done anything, but we build schools. We do all the stuff like this. But yet we're always second guess. We're being called colonizers for wanting to return to our ancestral land and build. But, but, but if we're coming there and then milking us dry and sucking our resources and sucking everything, everything's good. But we come there and start to build something and have something, everything, oh, we're taking advantage of the locals and everything. Which, what do you want? If you go to the continent and if you uh, 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 go black to Africa, it's a man, not your boy. <laughs> I like your show, though. Uh, he was saying that if you have a little bit, somebody who has, is going to still be jealous. Who wants to live like that? You mean tell me I got to be ragged and broken and uh, uh, beaten down just so the African will accept me? I got to look gr bummy and everything. I got to live in mediocrity, mediocrity. That's what it's all about. This is why we say our ultimate goals in Africa. Stand. Why? Because every town that we build in Africa is going to be technologically advanced. It's going to be. Right, that's uh, what we, Vamani believes in, and I believe in. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, we, we, have want the we have to elevate ourselves to a higher level of consciousness and a higher level of literally competing in the world. So, uh, brother, I know y'all. I'm just trying to make sure you get get a break from our talking so you can breathe. Yeah, I want to play. I want to play one. I want to play one of those videos. You want to play a video? All right, perfect. Um, uh, I sent it so, to you. I sent you in WhatsApp. Okay, perfect. So let me load uh, what you sent me. Yeah, the first one, uh, is short one, it's just a smart city, and the second one, the one in Egypt. That this is going to drive the one in Egypt is going to drive it home. Yeah, it's only I see the one in Egypt, and um, I see some for like. Liberia during no, I, I sent you two of them. I sent one. Hold up, let me see. Hold up. All right, I refreshed my page, but let me play the one okay, for okay. Egypt. Yeah, the other one didn't go through, but that one in Egypt, why is it a, a, a capital city? That one, I'm gonna send you another one too. Hold up, yeah, perfect. I'm gonna let this one load while we're talking, and then I'll get this one set. So, perfect. So, let's uh stop the share and Press share and just load the other one up and then we will uh, make it work. Yeah. And then let me know if you can see that. And then we'll I can see it perfectly. Yeah, I sent you another one. Okay, look perfect. at this. So let's get this one rolling. The capital of Egypt. From here, if we move east, we see the Sahara Desert, an arid landscape with nothing but a few highways crossing. In desert. But these satellite images you're looking at are from 2015. Ever since, a lot has changed, as the Egyptian government is completely transforming this region. What you see here is the construction of a new capital city, right in the middle of the desert. But why are they building a new capital? And why did they choose this unfavorable location for the project? You have probably seen these traffic maps that Google displays for its navigation service. 
where green roads means little to no traffic and red indicates strong congestion. This is how Cairo looks like on those maps in the morning. Traffic has become a real problem, just as the city's growth in general represents a massive political challenge. Of the 104 million inhabitants of Egypt, around 20 million live in the metropolitan area of Cairo. While the government buildings in many of the world's capital cities are bundled together in one place in order to simplify cooperation within the government, the Egyptian ministries are currently spread all across the city. This makes for long distances, congestion, and heavy pollution. And even when the ministries are closer together, like around the centrally located Tahir Square, the infrastructure is simply overloaded. Not only are there a number of ministries located, but also the Egyptian parliament, which requires special security measures and sometimes has to be cordoned off. Additionally, located right on Tahir Square is the Mugama. This is the main administrative building in Egypt where citizen requests are processed. So the political administration is a massive burden for Cairo, a city that is already under growth pressure. The population of Greater Cairo has been increasing rapidly for decades, at a rate at which urban expansion just can't keep up. And it is a development that doesn't only affect Cairo. In fact, the population of the entire country is growing at a rate that is higher than the growth of the world population. And the Egyptian government considers this a key threat to the country's prosperity. As far as housing is concerned, most of Egypt is dominated by the Sahara Desert, which is sparsely populated. This map of population distribution shows most people living along the Nile, and in the Nile Delta, where there is water for agriculture and industry, as well as a milder climate and fertile soil. The land for cities to naturally expand is completely exhausted. And since the Nile is the main source of water, accounting for 97% of fresh water in the country, the population growth also leads to a supply problem here. As explained in detail in my video on the conflict between Ethiopia and Egypt, the Egyptian government regards the country's dependence on the Nile as a threat to its national security. As today, Egypt is already suffering from water scarcity. Since the Egyptian government is facing these massive challenges with population growth, it is therefore trying to buy time, and has initiated a campaign under the motto, two is enough discouraging people from having more than two children, as well as making contraceptives more widely available and affordable. But even if politically unwanted, the reality of population growth demands answers. With only one option left, unfavorable as it is, Egypt saw itself forced to build new cities in the desert. Since the 1970s, massive new development projects have been set up around Cairo with the aim of reducing the strain on the capital city. In 1977, construction began on the 10th of Ramadan city. In 1979, on the opposite side of Cairo, the 6th of October city was built. Adjacent to it, in 1995, the Sheikh Zayed city as well as in the east, the cities of Abur, Al-Sharuk, Badr, and Madinati, as well as the largest such project to date, New Cairo, which construction began in the year 2000. These cities are not suburbs in the traditional sense, because the intention was not only to relieve Cairo of housing requirements, but rather to establish new separate metropolitan areas with their own local economy. In addition to large industrial complexes, these newer cities also host many internationally oriented schools and universities. The Greater Cairo area is growing at an enormous pace, and it seems that every new project exceeds the previously developed cities both in size and in ambition. Yet still, the project currently under development can hardly be surpassed in terms of ambition as the government is now creating a completely new capital, east of Cairo and New Cairo. 
Let's take a look at the plans for this city in detail. First of all, as a new capital, this administrative area was established, which will house all different ministries of the Egyptian government. These will move from their current spread out locations in Cairo to these ministry buildings which extend opposite one another along one central axis. Centrally located is the cabinet building in which the various government ministers can meet to coordinate their work. At one end of the axis there is a circular development in which other national institutions are located, including the post office headquarters and the Egyptian central bank. On the other side of the axis is People's Square, which will include the largest flagpole in the world, as well as two open theaters. This square is anchored by a large arc building, the Unknown Soldier Monument, referencing pharaonic architecture and commemorating fallen soldiers. This People's Square will also likely be the setting for future military parades. On the other side of the square, there are two buildings for the two chambers of the Egyptian parliament, the House of Representatives and the Senate. And north of this area is the Presidential Palace, the seat of the head of state of Egypt, which is also the most politically powerful position in the country. This new administrative center may seem straightforward. It resembles a formula that many planned capitals in the world follow, a large area full of grand city squares and wide avenues that demonstrate strength, and yet it is a layout that keeps the country's most important institutions relatively compact together. But where this Egyptian capital certainly stands out from other countries is with the sheer size of one ministry, the Egyptian Ministry of Defense. This is the Octagon. Comprised of ten buildings, it is the new headquarters of the Egyptian Ministry of Defense as well as the Egyptian military, and houses control, analysis, and data centers. When completed, this will be the largest defense complex in the world, surpassing the Pentagon in the United States. These buildings are part of an extended area with facilities for employees and military personnel, apartment units, places of worship, hotels, schools, hospitals, and administrative services, all located in this circular defense district. In a way, this is a city within a city. And the scale of this complex also serves as a strong reminder of the large role the military plays politically in Egypt. Ever since the military overthrow of Mohammed Morsi, the country has been ruled by former General Abdel Fattah Sisi. While these two areas are almost exclusively characterized by government buildings, the new capital is by no means intended to serve purely as an administrative center. Rather, the intention is for this city to become a new global center with a strong economy and vibrant city life. With Fundrise, the same kind of real estate investments that have powered the world's strongest portfolios for decades are now available to you. From properties generating income today to developments. For example, two ambitious sports centers are being built in the very north and south of the city. In Sports City, there are a number of outdoor fields, as well as a large indoor hall which has already served as the venue for the 2021 World Men's Handball Championship. The sports complex in the south of the city, the Egypt International Olympic City, is even bigger. Two indoor stadiums, as well as Olympic complexes for tennis, squash, aquatics, equestrian, and a large national stadium with a capacity of 90,000 spectators is under construction. The Egyptian government has also publicly signaled interest in applying for hosting global sports events such as the Olympics as well as the FIFA World Cup. Additionally, large places of worship were built in the new city, including two mosques in the east and west of the city.
Uh, Kali uh, Muti. Oh, yeah. And I said, imagine us hosting our own FIFA World Cup event. <laughs> imagine that shit. You know? You know? Yeah. The bottom line, this is going I wanted, to, I wanted to stop for a little bit. I wanted to like, really go on with the, right. the whole video. But right, right, uh, right. we get just the way to where uh, just trying to get your analysis on it. I mean, it's an incredible. I mean, you're building right. a whole new city out in the desert and expanding operation. Right. This is the future. Somebody in the chat room said, I feel like I'm in class. See, the future, this is what we're going to do. And the bottom line, we, 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 we want people to know that the Pan-African movement is not full of a bunch of dummies and big mouths. We got educated people here. You know, and we want you to have the confidence when you join us and whatnot that you're with educated people, you're with people that got sense and people that know what they're talking about, you know. And the whole thing is this, it's not always gonna be pretty. You have to think, see the whole this is like this is the whole thing. Like a former partner of mine used to always say, he goes, You have to have there's two types of things in the world. You have the landlord and the tenant, right? If you're a tenant, you don't care about the uh what goes on. In the uh, in the uh, building and everything like that, as long as you just come in and lay your head, you know. But you're a landlord, right? You have a different outlook. You're responsible for the lights, the gas, the taxes, everything. You have a different mentality. You have a different responsibility. It's just like when you're a manager on your job, you're in a position of power, right? Of, of a responsibility. Certain things you can't let slide. You got to like this. An employee just works and works and works, and he just goes home. He's like this. The management, you basically this. When you talk about an African stand, right, and nation building, you got to develop the management ownership mentality. You know, how will our roads be built? How will our courts respond? How will our educate? What kind of educate? This is the sort of things you should be coming in your head, right? Why? Because you're going to be responsible for these things. You're going to be responsible for electing people that's going to be responsible for carrying those things out. It can't be willy dilly and stuff like this. So when you, the ultimate idea of a nation state is a nation state is responsibility, taking responsibility. That means that one day that we're going to have people, we're going to be responsible for whether it's success or failure. It's going to be on us. That's the beauty about being free. If you fail, it's on yours. But what we don't want to do is fail because we're going to be doing so much work. But we could fail. But like every other country, success and failure and everything. But they, but they, what they do is, they make sure the people that you elect or people that guide you, right, are the best possible choices. So your 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 projection for success is at a ninety nine percent accuracy. But when you let dummies and idiots and charlatans run you, run you and everything, and you'll lead you, you're gonna go down. It's gonna fall. But when you sit back and say, you know something. You know, something I want to be able to say, you know, when I cast my vote or wherever like that, that the people that's in the, uh, the making decision that's crap, this architecture in this government that we're trying to build, have my best interests, have my core values at heart. What do we believe? We believe in a place for the black family to thrive. We believe in a place where people can inherit and pass down wealth and build wealth. People could be educated. People could live in peace and tranquility. You know, all these things that we were denied for 400 years. Living, we want a p p place where we have our own media, our own film industry, our own arts, our own sciences, and all the stuff like that. We're building a new civilization, and also we want also the most important thing. We want to decide who lives among us. If you are hostile towards us, then we don't want you here, black, white, or whatever. If you love us and you want to be part of us and you want to help and everything, you're more than welcome. That's our value system. We're never going to become what these people ever did to us. We're going to be a just people, you know, just it. That's our core values. And so therefore, when we have we have those core values and everything, it's up to uh, that, that. Then you become what we call a nation. We have a common set of people. We're com we come, we come one people. Someone asked, uh, uh, "Would the uh, uh, would this uh, create?" You like, "Yes, it will." If you have Haitians and all these people in the diaspora fighting against each other and everything, African Americans dissing FBA, ADOS, you know, it's kind of stupid tomfoolery that's going on right now, right? Once they get to the Africa stand, you know, none of that, all that stuff. You're no longer African American. You're no longer Haitian. You're no longer Jamaican. You're no longer Trinidadian. Well, that's what matters. You're an African, you know, you're part of Africa, you're part of the African state. That's what we're going to be teaching to our children. 
They're going to have be one flag, one identity, one black race, one black state. That sounds like fascism. Call it what the hell you want to call it. But that's the way of the future. Right now, you got uh, 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 none of these countries have ever, ever been able to forge a national identity. Paul Kagame trying with Rwanda. Botswana is a little more homogeneous, you know. Somalia is a little more homogeneous, right? But all these countries, Rwanda, you can have a, na a, a land, but you don't have a nation. You understand? Like South Africa has land and infrastructure, but it has no nation. It has millions of white people there. You got Negro peons that live there. You know, you have tribalists live there. You have people just, I, whatever the hell it is, you know? And so the whole thing is they, 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 you cannot build a nation with another race of people and everything, you know? Uh, you can't do it. You just can't do it. A nation has to be homogeneous. That means one race, one nation, one common heritage. What bonds us together is. We're all African slave descendants. You know, we're all African slaves and we all come from the West. They said, what about other Africans? Other Africans are more than welcome to join us if they like this. But you understand the, the, the responsibility of the African is for people of the African slave, particularly African-Americans, right? Because we're the ones that don't, never had anything. Then you got the Jamaicans, Haitians, the Romanians, and uh, Panamanians, and Afro-Mexicans, and all these other people that want to be part of a black state. You're some sort of colorist, or you think you're uh, more native indigenous to America, you are at, please stay away from us. We want people that want to be black Africans. We want people that want to marry black Africans, marry into the, when Africans want to come into, they want to marry into our culture, marry into society, more than welcome, you know? But I, well, the African has a purpose, right? We're the only group of people that have no real allegiance to any crown country in Europe. <laughs> Most countries in Africa still carry their lineage to, from Portugal to Spain to England. So like, we don't have that. Okay? So when we talk about the African, man, we're not going to be a Francophone country. We're not going to be an Americophone. Everything. It's going to be the first time ever since Liberia. You know, We're going to do it this time on steroids, right? Where this state has is going to be linking all the pan-african brain uh trust throughout the world it's going to be the center of the pan-african ideology it's going to be the first place where the pan-africans will be written into law you know that doesn't exist anywhere on the continent the first consideration of every country is is the imf and the world bank and the climate change people that's all their consideration pan-africanism is just some apathought that's why i feel bad when i hear pila lumumba Say this because the African and everything peel up among, but I love the brother, but he don't get it. Africa does not belong to Africans right now. The African stand is going to be bringing the strongest black people in one territory and build a state. That's going to be the game changer. Right now, there's no country in Africa that call itself an African stand. And we say, well, what, 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 how can you achieve African stand letters? Well, Paul Kagame, I would say, is at like 50%. You know, I would call Botswana. Botswana got a lot of white people there. They're sort of Afrikanish, you know. Namibia, forget about it. The whites in Namibia control the diamond uh, strips on the coast and the Kabibi strip and all stuff like this. And the Africans in Namibia can't even go on land that's restricted. The whites still control most of the game reserves, everything. So Namibia gets an F for Afrikan status. South Africa gets a, I would say, a D. I would say a C. It does have a uh, Julius Malema and, and so like, it gets a C, okay, for its Afrikan. Nigeria gets an F. It failed to basically build, uh, uh, it has land and everything, but it has hundreds of different ethnic groups and everything. It never forged one nation, one identity. It's not a nation state. It's a whole bunch of stuff created by, so it's still a British project, you know, basically. Ghana is trying. Ghana did have the year return. It's trying to become Afrikan and everything like that. Ghana has a lot of issues, but it's far better than like uh, than uh, thing. Liberia, it could be an Afrikan because it has uh, in its constitution only black people with citizenship. But the thing about Liberia is, until large numbers of black people in America start going there and everything like that, and uh, Liberia start coming home and then reverse the brain drain. I don't think Liberia will ever fall because in its constitution it protects it. You know, the only thing protecting Liberia is the constitution. White people can't become citizens. 
So we give Liberia, I would give Liberia as far as in Africa a B. A B, about a B. Gambia, uh, I don't know. <laughs> what would you give Gambia, uh, Bomani? Um, no idea. I'm just listening to you uh, grading these countries. Yeah, uh, uh, Gambia. Uh, well, there's a lot of Pan African stuff going on. No, 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 I can't do that. No, I haven't heard of it. Gambia, the entire expat community is at each other's throats, hating each other and hating on each other and everything. You know, uh, uh, Negro pianism is going crazy in Gambia and everything. It's a beautiful country, but I have to be honest, Gambia gets a friggin' D minus. You know, the reason why it only gets a D minus is because at least it's trying to. It does it has abandoned the African Americans and everything, but it still has large numbers of whites. I was listening to Africa Dumbass show the other day, and he had whites in the chat room commenting and uh, rounding up people and everything. What the well, Africa dumbass has white followers and everything. I'm sure he does. And it's a white. Yeah, but, um, but but I just want you to to put it in reference as far as Afrodemus or Afro dumbass or Afro whatever his name is. Uh, just you know, speak from a reference of uh, where this all started. Because I want to say you and I was doing um a, another video on you know the same thing we usually do videos on. Oh yeah, okay. Well, the the whole thing is this, right? Nation building, and then yeah, yeah, nation building. Well, this guy is running around. He calls our attempt at nation building Africa a colonizing. You know, he doesn't even understand what the fucking word. He's like, Liberia was a colony, even though Sister Kafambola scholarly put it out. Liberia was not a colony of anything, right? And the whole thing is this: they try to make it seem like black people from America colonized and did this stuff. And so I asked a question, right? So they want to lie on black people in America. They're so intimidated by black people in America, right? And they want to lie on us when they say nothing. Afro Afri dumbass has yet to talk about the Chinese that were basically mocking Africans and everything like that. He didn't have nothing to say about the Chinese that were beating Rwandans and Paul Kagame. Like he's probably disappointed in that, you know? Paul Kagame dis uh, uh, jailed a Chinese for 20 years and deported some other Chinese for disrespect of Rwandans and everything. Oh, no, that doesn't bother him. All the whites that are freaking uh, taking over uh, uh, thing, the, the white sex tourism in Gambia. He's a Gambian. He says nothing about that. But yeah, he's all up the bag's ass, right? Yeah, He's up the bag's ass so far he can look out of, their, out of their throat. That's how far his head is up their asses, you know? He's up everybody's ass with this uh, from the diaspora. So these people are nothing but trolls and like that. Because why? why? Because he has white people, white money. Paying them money and stuff like that to talk about it. the whites in Africa that, that think Africa is their little playground and everything fear us. That's why they got to this couple in Ghana and everything like that. Oh yeah, should build a community. Why? Because that strikes fear in white people. You know. The bottom line is, I urge all white people, you know, in Africa, sh either shut the fuck up or yeah, because you will go, you will lose this time, you will lose this war. You know, oh man, I'll, 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 I'll get it. Africa does not belong to you. The whole thing is this. Let me tell you something. I'm, I'm going to break them. Also, uh, Dines, uh, uh, Dines, uh, uh, Bumai, I'm going to do a show. I'm going to talk about the long history of Negro Peanism in Africa. I've never done this before, right? How in a marriage between African elites and, and uh, Europeans for hundreds of years, we the relationship between Europeans and Africa is deeper than we think it is, you know? And so these people in the modern era, they sent their kids to these British schools and everything. I see one Negro Pian, uh, uh, sister, real dark skin, like that. but she sounded like she was painted black. No, the, 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 the black American, she sounded like she just come from a London uh, a, a boarding school. Negro Pians. That's not a, look, let me tell you something, all African Americans uh, getting triggered by these stupid idiots on TikTok and everything and uh, these are not real Nigerians. These are not Ghanaians and everything. These are Negro Pians. These are people that basically think that it's some competition between Black America. They ain't got shit. Do you know there's more Ghanaian doctors and Nigerian doctors in America than there is in Nigeria? That's a shame and embarrassment. These people think nothing of leaving their country, leaving their people sick and everything just so they can live in the West. These people have, are in no position to talk to us. If I got people, I know people that's going to go to Ghana, several people that's going to build clinics and everything like that, African-American, we're already doing it.
doing major investments in Ghana, putting out blood, sweat, and tears in Ghana and stuff like that. Pretty soon, Liberia and all these other countries, you know? And we're doing all that, and all we're doing is, oh, you're colonizing all by these stupid YouTube trolls. You are not a brother. Having black skin and being born on the continent does not make you a brother. You're a Negro peeing race traitor. Your ancestor, and Aphrodamus almost bragged about being a descendant of slave traders. He says, oh, man, our people captured people. We weren't helpless victims. We kept it. He was basically, uh, brother, bragging about uh, 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 being strong. So in other words, basically this, the whole entire world, whether you think yeah, you're, you're better because your ancestors weren't on a boat, right? But the whole world looks at Africa side-eyes. The whole world still don't trust our humanity. Why? Because we willingly participate in the transatlantic slave trade. How about that? The whole world still looks at Africa like we're like, we believe in Africa. We know our people are good on the continent. But you got these Negro peons like Aphrodama still will get up there and boast about his ancestors were one of the ones that caught slaves and sold them to Europeans. Bragging about it. You know? That, uh, uh, that uh, you know? Adult turn, this guy is a racist. Am I a racist? Oh, I, you know, uh, look. If having a nation of my own and whatnot and saying that Africa belongs to Africa makes me a racist, hey, sure, I, I own the title. I guess I am a racist, you know? You know? <clears throat> Why is he allowed to spread hate on this channel? You know, how is it, you know, every time you basically put your foot up white people's ass, it's spreading hate. Oh, why are you spreading hate on this channel? It's not hate, it's telling you how it is. And the bottom line is this, pretty soon people are going to get their marching. All our people that's, that listen to us, that's spreading the BAO, the Africa, African message on the continent, and whatnot, they're going to basically be hunting you motherfuckers down. We're going to give you no damn safe haven. Africa is not going to be your safe haven. You need, I think you need to go elsewhere. I think you hike over to Australia, New Zealand. Get the hell off the continent because we're coming. There's an old philosophy called Ama Malenka. Ama Malenka in South Africa means the descending of African Americans onto the continent to wage a holy race war. This thing called a huru, you know? This holy race war where African Americans are going to come by the millions and ships and planes. That, that was during the time of Marcus Garvey. It's, it was called Ama Malenka, you know? And this final war is going to be getting a war of all wars called Armageddon. Because it's not over yet. The African is just the beginning. You know, the African is the beginning. You think you're going to have 500 years of what you did and get away with it? You can't get come. There's no forgiveness for slavery. There's no coming back for that. You think all those souls lost in the slave trade don't want to be avenged? Oh, I'm scaring people. I'm just telling you like it is. The African stand having a nation that's strong enough to challenge the West one day is going to happen. You know, it, it will happen. It's prophesied it's going to happen. So the bottom line, us sitting here in America... Uh, uh, playing around with these people and everything, it's time for us to build this. It's time for Africa to get on board. You know, understand, well, you're part of this global race war, whether you like it or not. Now, you, you're going to sit there, you see Ghana, we got to go to the IMF, the World Bank, for some money and everything. Pathetic. We can't take care of yourself. You can't give your young people a, a way of life and everything. You got to send them overseas so they can get some money to send back to the country instead of you getting together with Nigeria and all these countries and building your own West African currency and whatnot, backing by gold. And the fact that you could bring people from your, not only uh, Africans that live abroad, bringing them home, but building means by which you could basically infinitely bring millions of people from the West that want to come there and build and everything. Then you could basically print, write your own ticket. But the way Africa set up right now is Africa, Europeans benefit from Africa's brain. Which the slave trade still goes on. If you have a Nigerian kid that's a genius and everything, and every time I keep saying, oh, this guy is in Oxford, he discovered this. Why is he discovering shit for Europe? Why is he, why we got these Nigerian doctors? Oh, we got these Nigerian doctors in America. We don't need you in America. We need you, okay, we need you in Nigeria. People are dying of preventable diseases all over Africa, and we're bragging about uh, your degrees in in Oxford and all your stuff like this, you know, all this kind of nonsense. The way of the Negro pen is go, is a is is a failure. You thought you had some relationship with England and everything like that. You thought you had some relationship with France and all your colonial masters and everything. You think you have some relationship with Belgium and all this stuff. 
I want to say, how's a little pizza pe- pipsqueak like Belgium take over the freaking country? Do you know King Leopold was a moron? This guy was nobody. Belgium was just like one of the Habsburg uh, uh, backwater territories and everything. He just, somebody said, hey, you know how we can get money and get famous? Let's go to the Congo. 20 million Congolese, he butchered up. Do you see Afro dumbass talking about that? No. But he's butthurt about what Colin Genesis might have said on Dynasty's show or shit, you know? The Negro Pian's priority is fighting other black people. The Negro Pian, look what the Negro Pian does. The Negro Pian is, is a tribalist, right? But what's problem is this. When he goes to places, nobody he, he's nobody. At least, and I don't like this and everything, when I go someplace, I'm African-American, people are, oh, wow, you're at all. They know our history, know who I am and everything, you know? They know about Marcus Garvey. They know about all these people in the West. They know about jazz. They know about history and everything. I have a testament. So when he goes someplace and everything, instead of him saying, you know something, those are my people in America, I'm that too. He's jealous, you know? He's jealous. He says somebody could... Uh, Confuse him for, and nobody confused you to ask for no African American, you stupid fool. He said, Some girl thought I was African American. You probably feel so good about himself. She confused me for an African American, and oh, she was acting rude. Nobody thought your ass was no African American, you fucking dipshit, you know? So the bottom line is this this petty stuff, this bickering and everything. And I know for a fact, these are not people in the pan African circles that we're used to. These are Negro Pians. Because because somebody got a freaking YouTube channel and calls them Afro dumbass. Don't mean he's like this. These are despoilers and 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 not knuckleheads. So the whole thing is this: proof is in the pudding. Liberia, Ghana, we're already doing it, bro. There's nothing you can do. Nothing anybody can do to stop us. Nobody. Nobody can stop us. Nothing to do. This is prophecy. This is this is all right. it, it was it was bound to happen. This is destiny. This is about to happen. So the whole thing is this, and it's, the only thing is happening because. Let me tell you something right now, folks. You got a population of a billion people on the African continent. You got 60% of them under the age of 30. And you got no, no infrastructure for them. What do you think is going to happen if you don't get serious about developing? You think your guns and all stuff Europeans and Chinese give you to keep the population? Let me tell you something. There's no real nation states in Africa. What a nation state does? Protect its borders. It protects everything. African, what is army? There's never been, I think, only time in history. I don't think there's any time where you see Africa. Okay, well, Tanzania and Uganda, the only field war between two the African states, I think, in history. And I think there was a civil war between Eritrea and Ethiopia. Other than that, what is, what is African military used for? Squashing, uh, but to be in the streets, to put down protests and everything. That's what the African government is used for. Why do you think Cameroon right now? We don't even know who the president is. We don't know B is still alive. They're brutalizing people in Amazonia, Western Cameroon right now. You know, no one say anything about it. The French-backed government and everything is brutalizing English-speaking, uh, 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 brutalizing Cameroon. No one says anything about it. Who, where, did, where did weapons come from? The weapons come from France. France is there. That's why they disposed the Gabagbo 10 years ago. And brought Olada and, and, and Ivory Coast. Kawal, uh, Gababo was breaking out of the Negro Pians, uh, the French spear, and doing his own thing. They got rid of him. They'll have some people who have some legitimate grievances, arm them, and the same thing. Every time you look around, there's a coup in Africa. In 2022, we're still having coups. D- is this the future you want, Africa dumbass? No, wait, no, Afro dumbass don't talk about Afro dumbass report. He doesn't talk about France and everything. He'll never mention anything like that. But he'll tell he will sit there and troll with some African Americans who live in Gambia who just living on their uh, pension and, and, and picking on them. And that's another thing is we as black people and African Americans, the bottom line, no matter what you how you like it, we're still we're people. We gotta stick together. Whether in Africa, whether in America, no matter where we go, we go to Mars, we got to stick together. Because people think we're an easy target, we're easy mark. They have this idea because, oh, you know, you guys are so uh, this, you know, bottom line is this. Our blood is just as African as anybody else. 
So I don't have to kiss your ass just to be accepted. I, I'm, I'm, Africa was born to me. I don't have to kiss anybody's ass. We're part of. If you want to get tribal, we're an African tribe ourselves. How about that? People don't like that. So in other words, basically, you're supposed to go to Africa and just let everybody fucking just shit on you, talk shit about you. You're supposed to abandon your struggle, abandon who you are, your identity, and everything like that. Just to go, go. no, it don't work like that. Everyone, uh, that's why you see people leaving. Because you went over there with the wrong mindset. I'm going to say, look, the bottom line is that you take you with you. See, the problem you think you're running from, from the hell that the white man that did this to us and everything, that's never going to go away. You think you're going to go to Africa, right? And guess what? Those problems that you run, those demons that you're running from are waiting for you in Africa. They're waiting for you. They don't got to follow you to Africa. They're waiting for you. They're waiting right on the shores. The self-hate, the self-doubt, and all this pain and suffering and everything like that. When you go to Africa, if you don't get your mind right, it's going to be waiting for you. It's going to destroy you. Because I've seen this one video, uh, Brother Monty, right? Uh, years ago, right? It's probably, it's, this video really bothered me. You know, I, I got the video saved, right? And I'm going to give it to you one day, right? For the right, at the right time. It was an African-American girl, pretty, dark-skinned sister, right? And she's in Ghana on a beach. She says, yeah, I made the Ghana. And, but I could tell something happened to her in her life, right? And she just started, she was real angry. And she had a bottle of wine. And she was just like, I just want to die. Now, I, I saw that video years ago. Always stuck in my head. Now, she's made it to Ghana. Why is she unhappy? Why is she angry? Yo, so nobody understands my pain. I'm like, who is she talking to over there? You know? And she was just like, she was, had tears in her eyes. She was just like, ah, ah, ah. I said to myself, man, see, we, have, we can't just go to the continent. We have to have a support system. We have to listen to our people. We have to give them encouragement. We have to give them love and support. And we got to stop judging our people all the time. That we're human, we're going to make mistakes. But guess what? Like anybody else, for most things, you can be forgiven. And you can come back in our good graces. You know? We don't throw people out like they're trash. I'm not going to do that. You know? I love the idea of building an African nation that black people can come home to. Yes, that's a, this is common sense. The reason why people is, is, is catching on right now through Brother Bamani and everything is because no one, I, I'm the only one, like I said, that had the will to act on this. You know, and I'm grateful for Brother Bamani for giving me the platform to speak this. It doesn't conflict with what he's doing. It also it complements what he's doing. The idea ultimately an African state. A new African state, just like the, you see they build in city states all over the world. Why can't there be an African a state where black people from the diaspora can come and build? You had a brain drain. What, you know something? Say look like this. If you have a, Niger, a Ghanaian doctor or Nigerian doctor, do you think, listen to the college genesis, I'll say, no, you're Nigerian. You can't come here. Man, I'll be like, yo, bring your, come over here. We'll, 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 you know, you can come in Africa, standing. You go, you know, look, bottom line, come over here. That, see, that's the beauty about African American culture. We don't care about that. If you want to come and be part of us and join our culture, join our nation and everything, any black person is welcome. But you understand it's, it's for the African American diaspora. You understand that. But you're always going to be welcomed. You're always going to be able to become a citizen, whatever you want to do. We're welcome. Show me any other country in the world. Black country world that does that. Everybody, oh no, everybody this. You got you have, I've seen things in South Africa, right? But black South Africans are keeping uh Nigerians, everybody uh, out of certain because you people have medical degrees and that would decide not to go to Europe, go to South Africa, can't get work, being blocked by black South Africans out of je jealousy and envy. It says, hey, man, let's use this human potential and everything. You got people from the Congo, got good brothers, right? Good brothers. When I see, you look, but this is different to me. When I see another black man, this is the way I've been raised, right? I see a black man. I see somebody, I see myself, right? I see a brother from the Congo, right? In South Africa, right? 
And I said to myself, that could be my father, man, when I was young. I see he had two kids and everything. He has to sell fruit on the side of the road in Johannesburg because he can't use his medical degree because he, the, 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 the arrogant black people down there that control shit. I, that's why I never, I'll never accept no. It's, it's an abomination from another black man that has a vision. You have, you see a man has a dream. He will, he can be a doctor and everything like that, but you don't want that, you know, we got a jealousy. You don't want the black man in America and, and the diaspora have a land of their own or not because of jealousy and envy. This is the African mind. This is the evil that lurks in Africa. This is the result of the Europeans and everything. We weren't always like this. But the Europeans have made us like them. Negro Europeans, selfish, evil, petty. You know, you would rather see a field uh, a rot and don't do anything with it, right? Rather than help your brother and help him get something off the ground. We don't help each other. It's part of building, being a Pan-African is, is support. Is support. So I support all my brothers in the Pan-African struggle, no matter what you're trying to do. I'll support it. Why? Because ultimately, you know, like I said, I never asked anybody for a dime. I, in all the years I've been doing this, I've never made one single cent off of this. All I ask is that people listen to me. All I ask is people join the BAL social network, we're not, and get with the collagenesis. All I ask is people understand what an Afrikstan is and what's the ultimate, why it's so important, why are we living in these days and times that we cannot friggin' afford in the next uh, couple of decades not to be have a geopolitical voice on the world. I watch the African Union, right? And I look at these people like, these guys are deciding the future of Africa and we're not at the table. And don't tell me about no sixth region. That's a bunch of nonsense. The sixth region is a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell. It's something, it's the sixth region is just like the Ados FBA, something created online by freaking people and everything like that. People go, oh, sixth region, all this kind of stupid stuff. When they say the sixth region, they're talking about freaking black people born on the continent, right? Who live o abroad. They're talking about Europeans, they're talking about Asians, everybody else born on the continent is a called an African diaspora. See, we spell Africa with a K, we mean black African. Black African infrastructure. See, we're, we're the only race of people that you can come and call yourself an African. You can go, you got Europeans that have been born in China, Bay, they'll never call themselves Chinese. That's respect. But since there's no respect for the black race of Africa, Africa is, is, belongs to everybody. Oh, birthplace of humanity and everything. I'm an African. Because the bottom line, we're like the same black people always inviting everybody to the cookout. See, the African stand is where we stand. Stand means stand, you know? Where we stand, who's standing? The Africans, the African-American, the African diaspora with a K. That's where we stand. So a white person could never be called an African, you know? Why? Because he's not one of us. He doesn't stand with us. That's what stand means. Stand means stand, what we stand with. That's where our territory is. That's where we stand. That's where we made our front. That's where we have our government, that's how everything. This is where we our life is, where we uh, bled for. Blood on the soil. We don't have any soil, blood on the soil to, uh, 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 to, from heaven to God and everything. Let me tell you something, folks. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. This right here, see this dirt right here? This is African soil. And before you do it, you get yourself African soil, you pour your blood on the soil, and that means that one day you're going to return to the soil and have a land of your own. That's blood and soil. Nation is, uh, is, is forced through blood, bloodshed. And the bottom line is this, we're gonna, it's going to be trials and tribulations. The enemies uh, uh, around the world don't want this to happen. If you have an African American, African diaspora state, like called the African state, then it has its own media and everything and culture and everything. What do you think it's going to do? The culture you see in America is not us. They're creating all fuck culture and everything, all this degenerate shit and everything. If we create this beautiful pan African state and everything, what do you think is going to happen to to their projections of Africa or whatnot? You know, we're going to be able to influence Africa. If we could influence Africa right now, uh, what do you imagine? If we have a state where we're basically 
producing our own films, our own art, our literature and everything. What do you think it's going to be when a young African kid can come here and see what we're doing and everything? They're going to go back and say, you know something? You know, hey, you know, I think we, you know, we're doing things the wrong way. I think what we're doing right here. Right now, we're disconnected. The Africans don't know us and we don't know each other. Every other group of people around the world are connected. The Chinese have Chinatowns and Chinese businesses and districts all over the world where they're connected. The black race is still broken. The Panamanian don't know the African American. The Afro Mexican don't know the African Cuban. You know, we need a place where all of us could build, that we could come together and basically, no matter where we're from, and build. That's just common sense. Matter of fact, if I was any other race, there would be no collagenesis. It'd be just common sense. People just do it automatically. We wouldn't need the freaking collagenesis. We wouldn't need Brother Bamani. Any other group of people, this would be common sense. We're scattered all over the freaking world. Now, I can't expect uh, all these countries to accommodate us right now. I get that. The Accra, uh, uh, Abuja, and all these other cities, Yamasukro, all these cities, and that, they got to protect, they, they, they got to, they got deals with France and all these other, they got to feed their own people. I get that. But we're saying when we dot our own city state and as a cap, a geopolitical capital of the black diaspora, we can take care of ourselves. We're more than capable of doing it. So the bottom line is you say, well, geez, you know, I just, oh, just come to, you know, the bottom line is Nigeria, you got your own issues. You know, all these countries got their own issues. We can help. We can like that. But when we say our end game, we need that territory. That's the end game. We could be every place else. Now, I want to say like that's Nigeria. How come none of these countries have ever invited African-American businessmen, I think Jesse Jackson did, to get into our oil business? I think Jesse Jackson, oh yeah, giving Jesse Jackson some oil block and oil money is not enough. That doesn't mean anything to the rest of us. Oh, Jesse Jackson got something. The fuck does Jesse Jackson got to do with me? You know, I'm tired of hearing that shit, you know? One Negro goes over there and gets money in his pocket and whatnot. We're supposed to sit there. Yeah, you know, like NFL is about to do a deal with Jay-Z. What the fuck does that got to do with me, you know? You know, they always, they always do that, you know? One Negro speaks for everybody. Yo, know, that's why I say, you know, look, the bottom line is this movement, the African movement and everything, the BAO, and Brother Bamani, and the people that's connected with us, you come talk to us. They always find their own Negro to deal with, you know? Yeah, man, like, but, well, I, I told you the movement almost got hijacked by Dr. Arakana. Did I tell you that story? Okay, this is what happened. Dr. Arakana, Dr. Arakana, right, found out about the African right? In 2017, right? With Mr. Rosenthal, right? She took it and ran with it. You know? And started calling Wakanda. Uh, you're, 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 you're muted, Bamani. Uh, yes. Uh, how is it coming along? Yeah, you know, I said, she, she she basically took it and ran with it. You know, said, oh, we're going to build it. And I said, I told Mr. Rosenthal, suddenly all things changed. I said, well, we want to set up this. Oh, no. None of that, man. It's going to be like a city... So in other words, so you they're gonna die in the city and we got no say so in everything. Like we just sit there, you get the hell out of here, you know? <laughs> you know? No, no. Yes, brother, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. So yeah. and I, I was just trying to let people know who you're talking about. Uh this person right here. Because uh uh my, the, the name is pronounced different. You pronounce it as, as Afro dumbass. <laughs> yeah. Afro dumbass, Afro doofus, you know, you know, yo, you know he, you know he reminds me of Afro Damas. Afro Damas, yeah, he, he knows where he's a European, you know, Europe, <laughs> Nostradamus. He's a Negro Pian, so he's an African version of Nostradamus or whatnot on a YouTube channel, or whatnot. You know, this nigga yeah, looks brother. like, yeah, brother. Where did they get these clowns from? And these yeah, yeah, like, yo, he, yo, this wanna, nigga, yo, I want to be a YouTube star. Yeah, she's like, hey, this nigga, yo, this nigga, I want to pose that they got intellect. <laughs> Yo, Jay, this this nigga looks like fucking a black version of Rumpel Sosa. Remember that? Rumpel Sosa is my name. Remember that? The guy, remember the girl said she was like, uh, uh, like this. The guy made the uh, the uh, the wheat the turn wheat a uh, wheat into a gold, whatever. And uh, I said, now Rumpel Sosa is my name. Remember that? Yo, you gotta know my name. And you know, Rumpel, that's what that's what else on the book. That's what Aphrodite looked like. Yeah, you know? Rumpel Sosa is shit. You know, 
Yeah, okay. but it's just, it's, just, it's just funny, man. I, I just was listening to that show that you sent me Um, because you wanted me to analyze it. I couldn't watch it, man. It was just, I was like, this guy really think he, he's sharp. But anyway, man, I, you know, I give some of these folks uh, credit, but when they're trying to test. Well, they got balls. We, we, when it, we, I mean, you know, I don't knock the hustle, but when you're trying to come <laughs> at people, you know, like ourselves who are just, you know, who, who is out there, you know, you put in the work and you study and you know what you're talking about. You know I mean? You have seen the world. You know, evolve and change. And you're talking about nation building, investing, black cooperative economics, and then some other people calling you colonizers and things like that. You know, and you know the thing of it is, we're stolen Africans returning to African continent for the purpose of nation building. Strictly it, right to the point. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? If uh, you know, if it was all figured out in Africa and we weren't needed, you know, maybe there was no need for us to, to go, but. The need is there for us to reconnect as a people and put our economic strength together. And for people who just wanted to think that we're coming to colonize, ain't coming to do all that stuff. Anybody, any 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 brother or sister from the African continent who want to call us any names and things like that, uh, the, the reality of it is you know, they're illiterate and ignorant because look at the people who are actually doing the damage. All the people that I got coming into the country are offloading investment, money, building schools, building business, enterprising and things like that, contributing, creating opportunities, uh, sponsoring children, uh, supplying a whole bunch of school supplies, things like that. And that's doing the best people can do in this, you know, investing in fresh industries and creating, you know, more and more opportunities. So that should be, you know, blessing and that's, you know, we should be getting more love and things like that. And that's the issue. So people like Afro Dumbass, you know, they should be, you know, petitioning their government to, you know, to open up things for us as a people from the diaspora to create uh, for, for us to come in and do the things we need to do. And I'm letting people know whatever is going on in the Gambia, because I never understand what's going on in the Gambia, uh, literally. And I've talked <coughs> to many people I know in the Gambia. Well, I can give my Well, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't need to. Yeah, I, I'm just saying that in general. But you know, the, the, the reality of it is any uh, drama or whatever that went on from America and there, it's the normal reality of life people go through and things like that. It's just for some reason they're single, they're singled out. But then again, uh, that unapologetic Negro pin that you know we ran off YouTube literally made that, that whole case famous by being an instigating punk, running his mouth like you know, like it's a little schoolgirl always gossiping. And right. these things literally cause damage. You know what I mean? And one of them people are specialized in damage control because people are always coming at you and trying to destroy what you're doing. And you know, and the thing of it is. You know, if you was just starting, you just turn back like, man, this is just nothing but foolishness. But when you've invested a long, long, lot of time, almost two decades of your life and working with so many other people, you know, we got to make this work and we can't let people like them define the movement. The foolishness that's going on in the game, that doesn't define the movement of repatriation. Repatriation right. is a serious process. It's a, you know, and it's, you know, it's our right to return to the land of our ancestors, but it's only for the purpose of nation building because, hey, what happened? We we're stolen. So there's obviously a problem. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not like, you know, we just got up and just, you know, we just walked to the shore and got on some luxury yacht, luxurious yacht. Right. We, That's what they think. They think they think so. And then you're giving, like, you're giving one of those fancy resorts to run and you're managing it with your family. You're making living like you know what i mean like you wanted to buy contractors that's making six figures just by going there and do certain things no nah, this is we are stolen as a people you know what i mean so the thing of it is when you had these people like this that's why you said me about afro dumbass and things like that that's why i always wanted to put the name of this so i can look at look at it uh because he him and the unapology and negro pian represent you know the illiterate people in our society the people who have no balls and the only thing they do is commentate and spec spec it and what they also do is they push out bad negative energy and they confuse people and they you know and, and so on. Oh, they do you do lie to me. What, what we're doing is the, the reality of it is there's so many black people in America that don't give a damn about Africa. Let's be right. real about it. And I can say about 99 percent of people that they they have their own business and life to do. So I do understand it. I'm not saying that you know so the ones of us who do and we're trying to make our best effort, it'll be nice if some of our own brothers and sisters would say hey Let's give them more support. Let's do this and do this. But instead, you have you know you have that nigger in, in Europe, and then you have this Afro dumbass uh, from the well, he's, he's even from the Gambia. From Gambia. You, have, you have other YouTube clowns on there. I don't know if that's why they make their little change for the gas money to get around. No, that's what it is. That's all the niggas they make little, YouTube, little suffer money. But you know what I mean, we're talking about real business and real life changer. 
from doing what we're doing by literally putting our economic energy together and doing real investment. And at the same time too, also trying to educate our people on the African continent that when you have black people from the African diaspora coming, whether you're in Ghana or the Gambia and so on, sh show more respect to our folks. Understand that some people feel like they're starving and got to eat, but cheating and robbing us is not gonna is not gonna progress us. It's vandalizing our property and, and doing these things. Yeah, we don't. Now, trust if, you if you want to do these things, honestly, I mean, I'm being honest. If any African national or citizen there on the continent want to do these things, do that to the foreigners. Those of us that are coming, we're stolen Africans. It's a big difference. So that's one of the problems that I have on the African continent. Little to no one understand the history of stolen black Africans and the diaspora. It's a major problem. It's one of the problems that's called confusion. And as a matter of fact, it's one of the things that since all of our tours are based on reconnection, we end up educating our own people in Africa literally about where we're going and things like that. We yeah. have African Holocaust dungeons all over the place. Who you see there? The foreigners. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's what it is. So I'm not here not knocking everyone. I'm just saying these are the situ situations and issues. And we have a we as a people have to resolve them and things like that. We have, we have a serious issue with e education opportunities in Africa, which causes ignorance, stupidity, and mm -hmm. causes and problems. And then us as a people literally thinking that since we're open to going to Africa, that the, the, we're going to get this red carpet rolled out for us. No, it's a grind situation. People look at you as their meal ticket. People look at you as how they can you know, do whatever they can do. And then also there's people looking at to doing good business with you. So I'm not just speaking one side of the story. I'm just telling folks, that's why we provide consultation. And I'm always advising anyone that's looking to tour, live, travel, do business on the African continent, and you're looking to do it on a serious level, reach out to us. Hey, you know, um, initial conversation, always good. You may have to pay some consultation for us to really put together something for, us, for you. But at the same time, too, that's how it works as far as business, trying to make sure that you have the right people in place and people who we can keep accountable. Those things are serious. A lot of time people are making these moves and they're not thinking about these things. And, you know, you know you're thinking that, you know, people are seeing you as what they're seeing you for. And then, you know, you also have guys going to places and they feel like they just run into someone and they fall in love and things that are, I'm like, people have to understand the game of how things are in the world of our struggle as a people. You know, some of us have a little more advantage. I was born in Kingston, Jamaica, so, you know, and grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I have the street mindset and I understand these things. And which has made me very successful on being able to just navigate <coughs> countries and being able to deal with people and deal with certain things and make it work. Because, you know, we have to make it work at the end of the day. I mean, all we have is us as a people. But at the same time, too, it can't be a one-side thing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so we do need more of our people to learn more about us, understand us, open things up for us, and accommodate us more as a people as we're looking to make these things. Because literally, we're stolen. And many people, like we talk about in the high numbers, have don't, don't care about that situation. You know, And they don't even draw up things and say our own people don't like us. We would never go that far. Some of our own people are not feeling us because of hatred and jealousy and things like that. And some of them don't know what's going on. And some people just look at you as some privileged black people from somewhere else. And I mean, so all these things are things that we have to really think about. And that's why my brother, as we talk about with our subject, talking about literally Afro stand. And that's what, you know, and as a matter of fact, if you just, if someone said, if you call, if you ask me, since you're talking about the topic, if you actually, like, but money, if the state that we're talking about was set up and you were going to Africa from the beginning and that was one of the main states you're doing business with, how successful you'd be, I would say a million times more. Yeah, that a million times more. How much stress and frustration you have de dealing with making moves yeah. in different countries and dealing with different people. You know what I'm saying? The things that I... If you, you know, had... Let me say this. If you had a country, right, that sole purchase purpose is right from the get-go is being able to facilitate you whatever let me give you a perfect example of what i'm talking about right japan first of all you, you, in order for you to understand i want people to do this right? right i know people watch a lot of videos and everything like that you know and uh and uh and uh go to the library right pick a book the library is a very invaluable thing one of the countries two countries i pe i think people need to study is japan and singapore you know perfect good great okay, yeah check this out Japan has a lot of videos out there, right? You know, there's one series that's on uh, that came out in 1990 called uh, 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 "The Pacific Century," narrated by Peter Coyote, American actor Peter Coyote. It was a 12-part series, right? I have it on my uh, 
my Ning site, but it's somebody they took it down, right? My Ning site, my my documentary site, they took it down. But you can still find it though. I guess somebody republished it and everything. One part where I was fascinated was they said the Japanese, one of the trading companies, Japan is so organized, right? It had a, tra- a guy that had a trading company. The trading to Japan didn't have uh, raw materials, right? It made its money from manufacturing, right? And uh, importing goods to, to process, right? And manufacture and everything. So the trading companies have to go uh, bring the stuff in from Asia or whatever like that, you know, and to the man- to make it get to the port. Now, what, the one part I saw where the, the guy that's ahead of this trading firm, right, went down to the port himself, right? And basically was telling the ship, why the ship's not docking? And we're about to run out of supplies in one day, you know, right? of this product they're making. And then they got right to the thing. Okay, we got right to the assembly line that's making. What I'm trying to say is this, though. The government and private sector work so seamlessly together. The private sector, the government tells the private sector, I need you to import this, right? See, we live in America, right? I always hear this all the time, right? Particularly when we go to Africa, right? This is what never happens, right? They'll say, oh, we'll help you set up a business. Well, in Asia, right? This is what they tell them. This is what we, we're going to help you set up this business. You have this technology. We're going to tra- show you how to do it and everything like that. Give you the tools and everything like that. We want you to uh, process this. Well, I want to make bicycles. No, we don't need you for that. We want you to do this. Why? Because we're importing these parts right here. That's draining our currency. So we need the stuff made here. You're going to make this amount of money a year and everything. Okay. And that's the way the Japanese mind thinks. I'm making money. I don't even know what I'm making, but I'm making money. The American mind, the Western mind, we go to Africa with the Western mind, right? And we try to build it. That's why you got people, 3,000 people selling shea butter. You know what I'm saying? There's no coordinated effort between the African American and the Ghanaian to say, you know something? Like, uh, 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 Woody Meyer did a video a year ago saying, we don't have no factories and everything like that. Well, wouldn't it be good if the Ghanaian government, right, got up his ass and said, you know, African Americans, y'all like come over here and invest in everything? Can y'all learn how to bring this chocolate? I know some of y'all work in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Maybe even like learn to know something, right? Can we set up our own chocolate industry for process- processing our chocolate? There was a Nation of Islam guy that had some chocolate, you know, milk chocolate for sale that, that was doing that. But it's only going to be on a small scale, but it looked pretty good. It had a wrapper and everything. I guess they got a factory over there. But that's the right that's the right tool. Ghana, uh, president went to Ghana and said, Spain, you owe it to us to teach us how to make chocolate. I mean, it's just embarrassing. Because we go over with the mind, well, I'm going after a start a business. But did you talk to, is there a ministry of trade or ministry of industry? And they tell you like this. Why? Because Europe, uh, Africans are following the European model, which, oh, you just, oh, as long as you're making money, uh, I don't, we don't care what you make. No. Well, we need you to do this. Oh, we need you to build smart schools. You know, can you do smart school learning and remote? We'll pay the, we'll, the money that we're going to spend. It, we'll pay you uh, uh, so many million dollars there to build schools, build clinics and everything like that. We'll pay you. See, this is a sort of relationship that has, has to happen. You cannot do this unless you have political and will and relationships. Right now, the relationship between Black America and the Black uh, in Africa is funding games. It's going over there on feel-good stuff. But when they get with the Chinese and everything, it's real business. And then when we go over to Africa, right, we don't expect to bid on major contracts. We have construction people. Why Why have some of that money? Do you know who benefits the most from the African Development Bank? Not Africans. You know, Lebanese firms get these construction contracts and road contracts. Indian firms. Now people say, oh, yeah, we got the African Development Just like the African Cunion, you know. Oh, we got the African Union. Call you and tell you nothing. We, we, we just go by these names, African Development Bank. Yeah, and all the money for the African Development Bank, most African uh, businesses don't qualify for all the criteria. But if they got with partner with African American firm, they said, "Look, let's let's find out what we need to close the gap. Let's the government and everybody say so we can win." But there's no political will to do that because all it takes is an envelope or a suitcase full of cash, and all that's out the door. There's no pan African will to make sure that the infrastructure and everything in Africans are built by and controlled by Africans. You understand? This is why an Africa stand is so important. For what for we control from day one, 
what gets built, who gets built, and everything. If we have hired a Chinese firm to build something, it's going to be a skill set transfer. It's going to be written into law that we have to benefit and get the uh, knowledge transfer. You cannot do that currently in Africa, you know, because it's not set up that way. There's no pan-African estates, you know. So we're bringing this ideology of pan-African to the motherland, you know. And so that's why I say, you know, we have to do we have to do this. You know, we have to do this. You know, we have to do this. It's, 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 it has to be done or we're going to perish. Uh, excellent, brother. Excellent. Um, this is a video that you sent. Um, I can play it and then it's, yeah. a, it's a short one so I can play it all the way through and then you and I can right. talk about it. A smart right. city, which would be, um, you know. Yeah that main conversation that we need to really uh, get into. Yes. Art is your city. Chances are it's getting smarter by the year. Many governments around the globe are racing to infuse technology into just about every aspect of its city operations. And I mean every part, including public transportation, IT connectivity, water and power supply, sanitation and solid waste management, efficient urban mobility, e-governance, and citizen participation. And it does this using every buzzword imaginable, from big data to the Internet of Things. So how does a smart city work? Let's look at three examples. Here in Singapore, the city-state might be the gold standard of the most extensive effort to collect data on daily living. The government is now deploying systems that can tell when people are smoking in prohibited zones or littering from high-rise housing. Singapore launched its own Smart Nation program in 2014 and will add more cameras like these so the government can effectively monitor crowd density, cleanliness of public spaces, and even the exact movement of every locally registered vehicle. Much of the data it's collecting will be fed into an online platform called Virtual Singapore that gives the government access to how the city is functioning in real time. It could help the government predict how crowds might react to an explosion in a shopping mall or how infectious disease might spread. Over in Dubai, more than 50 smart services from 22 government entities have been rolled out as part of the government's Smart Dubai initiative. Using the government-provided app Dubai Now, you can do things like pay a speeding ticket, which likely captured you on a public camera and then emailed you the ticket directly. You can also use the same app to pay your electric bill, call a taxi, track a package you sent to your friend, <coughs> the nearest ATM, renew your vehicle registration, track the visa <coughs> status of a relative, and report a violation to the Dubai police. Now head over to Barcelona, where one research firm estimates the city will save billions of dollars a year in energy costs just by installing smart systems like these. Number one, smart streetlights. Public lighting that adapts and dims when there's no activity but brightens up when sensors detect motion. The second, parking sensors. Instead of driving in circles looking for a spot to park, drivers can get real-time information on an app which locates free parking spots. Sensors on the street curb use lighting and metal detectors to know if a parking spot or loading area is occupied. And finally, garbage sensors, which are actually compact drop-off containers which have a vacuum network through pipes which sucks up trash below ground. The automated waste collection not only lowers noise pollution from garbage trucks, but also lowers costs and keeps bad odor away. Juniper Research estimates that by 2021, cities will save nearly $19 billion by making their cities smart. But of course, to save money, sometimes you have to spend it first. The global smart city market is estimated to attract $15 billion by 2021, and that's just for software. So now companies from Microsoft to Cisco are aiming for a piece of it. In Singapore, Upton Saidi, CNBC. Yo, know, like I said, man, you know, we could talk with blue in the face, man. The bottom line is this, we, you know, <laughs> we could talk to a blue in the face, man. We're either going to be left behind. Uh, you see that smart city? You see the trap, all the problems that we have in Africa with trash and stuff like this? You know, it's, you know, it's just, like, like I said, we just got to, we have to just keep pushing on. You know what I'm saying? When we talk about the Africa stand, we're not talking about people sitting, we're talking about building the future, futuristic state. You know, the, the latest technology. We're going to gear our children up to think of the future. You know, uh, everything is just smart, advanced. 
You know, we're a futuristic people. And we want to take Africa into the future. You know, take the black race into the future. We have it right. We look, Let me say something, man. You should, as a black person, right, should not have to basically go to Europe or America just to live a first world decent life. You should not have to go to Europe. Why well, would go to Europe and everything? And that's what it is. It's the infrastructure. The black man does not have it. Rome built, conquered the world. Why? Because it had infrastructure. All roads lead to Rome. Rome built a global worldwide trading system, ports, uh, aqueducts, roads, everything, you know, in the ancient world. Somebody from friggin' the Roman province of Mauritania could trade with uh, uh, somebody from uh, 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 the Roman occupied trade to Greece easily, you know, in real time. That's what infrastructure is, networks, systems, logistics, and everything, you know? It makes the ease of doing things better. We don't have that in the black race. We don't have infrastructure. We basically rely on the Europeans' infrastructure. If we want to fly to Africa, we got to fly over to Europe and do a changeover. You know, because we have not built the airlines and everything like this. After all these years of independence, we're still uh, dependent on Europe and the West for basic things, airline services. You know, we uh, we got to keep our money in European banks, you know, and they give us what they think our, our cocoa and gold is worth. You know, infrastructures also mean financial. It's time for us to build our own financial infrastructure globally. And can you imagine if you have all the millions of black... Do you know, do you know I'm going to tell you something right now what people don't realize? I like the city of Portsmouth. Black people run that shit. That means we control the city uh, employees' payroll. Probably worth a couple of billion dollars. Black people run the city of Hampton, Newport News, you know, Norfolk. We control the city of Baltimore. All these cities got pension funds that they invest in overseas and stuff. We could basically be the vanguard of, of billions, hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars funneling into the continent. But I'm not going to uh, uh, say send, spend, send our money in a rabbit hole. We need a state to be the facilitator of that. So what we're basically doing, folks, is reversing the transatlantic slave trade. As we pull our money out of America, right, we make our money in America and pull it out of America, we're going to be putting it in Africa. But we're not going to put it in some uh, country. We're going to have that one state that we have our own commonwealth. Hey, that's a good thing. Commonwealth. You can have a uh, country. You don't have to be sovereign, but you can be commonwealth. I, gave a, I, I put a list of... Um, of uh, 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 hold up. Of a, uh, 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 let's see, micro states. Let's see, I'm gonna see something. I'm gonna see something. Micro states, micro, micro states in Europe. There are 10 states that aren't nation states, people call sovereignty, I think. There's Monaco. Monaco is a rich city. I think it's in France or Spain, one of them. It's a micro state. You know, okay, say, we, we, they don't even notice that. All they know is people vacation there and stuff like that. This is San Mar 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 uh, Marinino. And there's Andorra. Let's just sign. That's a tiny country in Europe. There's Vatican City. There's Malta. There's Luxembourg. Montenegro. Valduz. Uh, Anadora La Vela. These are all micro states, states and whatnot that are wealthy and rich and everything like that. But you don't think of them as nations, but you know, okay, uh, they're micro states, you know, that sometimes they uh use the sovereignty of the African. But now they, they could be members of the, of the European Union or wherever like that. But this idea that uh, the diaspora cannot manage their own state or micro state and everything is absurd. You know, it's exactly what the African continent need. Can you imagine what our central bank will be able to do for the African continent? If we basically, if we got access to billions and hundreds of billions of dollars worth of capital that we generate in the, in the West, you know, it's just a win-win situation. What country in Africa would not want to build that African state? What country would Africa would not want to host that? 
what country that would not want to invest in that? A long-term investment. So, like I said, we have other things we go to Africa. We have communities. We have people doing it all day. But all of us have to be on the same page as our end game is as more of us start coming to the continent as this grows. Because, like I said, we hopefully with the Africa movement, it's going to attract a different breed of black people. It's going to get black people who've never thought about Africa involved. They say, oh, you're talking about building a futuristic uh, 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 smart city? Yeah. Oh, I'm down with that. Oh, government. When we start laying it out, what type of government we want and everything, how the government said anything, you got a taste of it with the smart city uh, video we just showed. You know, then now people who listen say, you know something? I, 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 I could do that. That's when you're going to get the type of black, the numbers of black people from America involved. Like, this yeah, shit. You're like, well, that's better than America. You have to, Africa has to compete with America. First of all, Africa has to compete for with America and Europe for its own citizens before it competes for African Americans. You know? So we have to bring the trajectory, right, back to the continent. And South Africa was a disappointment because we had lots of Africans with, that went to South Africa and they couldn't get jobs. The black South Africans didn't see the vision of this. Like, you know, that could have solved the problem because whites like, yo, we, we ain't going nowhere. Y'all need us, right? And Nigerians say, you know something? We got these skills here. But the black South South Africans rejected the Nigerians that came there with skills. You know, they want to criminalize them. They want to focus on the Nigerians doing bad things. That's what the mind we have. They've completely forgiven the Afrikaners and the Boers what they did. But you want to focus on what the Nigerians are doing. So, uh, anything else, Brother Mamani, brother? Yes, uh, brother. Yes, uh, you covered most of it, and uh, let me just block this stroll block. Yeah, so collagenesis, brother. Uh, we went all into it, and, and there's more. We're gonna keep talking about this topic, the Africa. There, you know, we're gonna keep talking about this topic. Why? Because it's catching on. You know, I finally got a platform where where I could talk about this topic uninterrupted, you know? Wow. Because, It'd be interrupting you, brother? Huh? No, but but I don't think people are on this level. I don't think people are really on this level of talking like this, you know? You know, it's like, oh, you know, they go into, look, look, I understand everybody, what they want to do in Africa, but I've been doing that just for a long time. Now I waited for the right to, to, to bring this out. I think now is the time. Now that I see all the stuff happening in Tanzania, Gambia, and everything, I said, I told you so. You can't just come there with that black power, stuff like that, to these people. They don't want to hear that, you know? They don't have the same experience with white people you do, you know? So you have to basically say, you know, okay, I'm living in Africa, but uh, your end game has to be a nation state of your own. You have to build Africa from a position of power and strength. You're not going to build Africa... Uh, going over there being weak. You have to be in numbers. You know, what Monty was saying earlier, we have to stick together on the African continent. It doesn't matter, you know? We have to watch out for each other. We have to be a community of people, you know? That don't mean you're segregating yourself from the local. It's just saying you're basically squatting up. You're just basically, you know, hey, look, you're handling your business. And that's how you're stronger on the continent. You're strong. You'll be more valuable on the continent, you know? And also, let's be honest about ourselves. It shouldn't always be about how we can benefit Africa. We have to start looking for ourselves too, you know. And so we got to create a win-win situation, you know, a win-win situation. You know, it can't be always we losing, you know, and some people gaining and whatnot. And whatnot. We walk around like, "Hey, I ain't got shit," you know. We have to have a win-win situation. We can't be taking L's all the time in Africa, you know, and calling it love and brotherhood and shit, you know? <laughs> can't be taking L's all the time. Absolutely. <laughs> We've been taking too many L's. <laughs> We've been taking L's all the time, man, you know? You know what I mean? Like, 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 like we like, you know, charity. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm tired of taking L's, man, you know? No? You know? Hey, L, take it. You got to hold that L, man. Y'all don't. Yeah, yeah, yep, no, sorry. Can't keep doing that, you know? We took an L of Bianca. You know, we got, you know, we took, a, we take, we take L's all over the place. Yeah, serious, man. So, 
So family, you know, these journeys uh, that we do in Africa are foundation, but um, the difference makers, us coming together strong to work together with the best of our people on the content and, and, tours. and making tours. it happen. So, tours. Yeah. tours, visiting the continent and stuff like that. There's a lot of opportunity in Liberia as far as like investment and stuff like that, business opportunity, plenty. You know, I like I said, I want to be, this is part of a global, see that people understand something. You go to Liberia, it doesn't end in Liberia. You go to Gambia, you don't end it. You're part of a, of, a, of a global thing. So even if you go to Liberia, support what's going on in Ghana. If you go to Ghana, support what's going on in Liberia. That's what we're talking about. The people get so, oh, I'm Ghanaian now, you know? And no, look, no, you're part of the African for African diaspora. You're a black American or African diaspora living in Africa. You're part of our, our African nation. That's what I consider. So the bottom line is the idea that you're going to lose yourself and everything. That's what happens. You go off there by yourself, and then you complain, man, I, got, I had to go back to America. I lost everything. That's why. Because you want to be on your own. You're loud. You're arrogant. You're ignorant. You know what I'm saying? You're abrasive. You're unruly. You don't want to listen to everything. And then when you lose everything, that's a man, I, I ain't never going to Africa. I lost everything. Because you weren't listening. You were, you were hard-headed. You know, and black some black people, like I said, I don't know what it is. Why do some black people think that there's no rules and regulation in Africa? They could do whatever they want to do, and oh yeah, no, it don't work like that. There are laws in Africa too, you know. There are people are gonna tell you no, there's people are gonna set you back and everything. Same thing in this. But if you basically understand that, right, then you could basically navigate and understand how to win, you know, how to win on the on the continent. But if you basically go over there like, oh, I'm in Africa, and you can't tell me nothing and whatnot, uh, I'm in my motherland. Yeah, we understand that. But the thing is, that country that you're going to still have laws. They still have rules and regulation. They still have people there that might be a little more Ghanaian than you are. There's people there that are hungrier than you are. There are people there that's more entitled than you are. You know? There's nobody going to roll out a red carpet and say, oh, welcome. Akuna Matata. Remember coming to America? Remember that? You know, people throwing out rose petals and, you know, come here. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not like that. It's the real world. You're dealing with real people. These people are real. You remember that movie? You've seen a movie of Last, Scot uh, 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 Last King of Scotland? Yes. Yeah, I've seen it. Remember that one part when Edie, I mean, that one part that really stuck with me when he says, we are real. Remember that? I was getting serious with the uh, Scottish guy. Yeah, he goes, we are real. He goes, your death is going to be the first real thing. Like he knew his whole life, you know? He said, your death is going to be the first real thing you ever experienced in your life. He goes, he been, we are he, real. He'd he been so privileged. Yeah, he goes, we are real. You know what I'm saying? And we have to realize that when you go to Africa. And that's what Afro dumbass understand. I take Africans seriously. I don't get up there and tell like like and the Africans are so, so stupid to realize that we're any sort of threat to them. He don't take Africa. He don't take his own brothers. Yeah, it's it, it, it fools like that that you know stir up unnecessary problems. I mean, it's kind of like loose lips sinking ships. Right. But he's well, well he's well, he's one of Western educated Oreos. He's an Oreo. If you if you shot him, man, it, blood wouldn't come out. White pus will come out. You know, he's white on the inside. You know, I don't know. Him, white devil. Um, you know, girl. Yeah, all, all, that white, all that white. All that white. If you shot Aphrodamus, right in yeah. the center, he'd be like, "Uh, all this white pus start coming out of him." You know, what I'm saying he's white on the inside. He's a Negro pian. You know, no, no, the no, bottom no. line is that he don't even respect his own people. The fact that but that that. There's no way we're going to build in Africa without the help of Africans. There's no way that we're going to build with Africans benefiting. If we build smart, say, who is going to benefit the most from this shit? The Africans on the continent. You know, when we, when we do our tours and whatnot, who do we spend our money with? Yes, absolutely. Africans so, what, so, so, so why would an African dumbass? So like this, the bottom line, we take Africa seriously. It's not enough. It's not enough to say I love Africa. I respect Africa. 
Yeah, yeah, that guy just, you know, he just got a show. I don't think he even have any experience doing anything in Africa. Just because you're from the content don't mean that, you know. Don't mean shit. I mean, show me, you know, what you got. He ain't got nothing. So. So, like I said, we, we, we rock these motherfuckers tonight. Get my book, Journey to the Promised Land. You know, I got my brother Kofi working on this to make this a movie. He, they doing art for us or the pictures. He's taking this guy is so deep into this book, right? I, everybody reads this book is so into this. Now, I, I wrote this book like eight years ago, right? I don't forgot most of what I wrote, you know. And this guy said, oh, Yeah, what do you think about? I'm like, you know, and there also this one movie, right? Where we just we just let girl track down the author, right? The guy was living somewhere in Maine, whatever. He said, yeah, she was like, I want to get into your book. That one character, when he said this, what did he mean by that, you know? So that's why you're a good author. You ever see that movie, Murdered by Death? Remember Peter Falk back in the days? I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, I can't remember. I remember. Oh, yeah, it, was back, it came on HBO. It was on HBO, Murdered by Death or not. That's why I think Agriculture, like, they, she invited all these, she invited all, this guy invited all these authors, right, to a house for murder mystery, right? And it was a prank, right? But it was like, uh, 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 at the end, she was like, yeah, all your, uh, you left us with cliffhangers and everything like that for all your readers. It was a good movie. It was made in like 1978. It was with Peter Falk was starting, right? But when you write a novel, right, you got to know how to get into people's heads, right? Because people ask me, well, that character right here, what did she mean by when she said this, you know? Well, so that's a good novelist, man. When you can make people think, you know what I'm saying, about the work you do and when you make characters up and stuff like this, that's a, that's, that's a good novel. I'm not tooting my own horn or like that. But Kofi's like doing pictures and everything like that, you know, of the Azor, the people. And uh, he was asking me about the the, 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 the asylum and way. I said it was really based on King's, uh, King Masakoy of 1920s when he married the, uh, the uh, Hillary Johnson's daughter and whatnot. So I, I fictitiously added that story into the novel, even though it happened decades before, uh, mm -hmm. de happened decades after my novel was supposed to be written, right? So I just, I just, I fictitiously added that character, those characters in there, you know. So, mm -hmm. so bottom line is this, you know, that's that's what it is. When you read this book, man. <laughs> You're gonna want to go. You're gonna want a journey to Africa. You want you want you want to experience this. You know, you're gonna like what it's like to build a nation in Africa, leave America, and let me tell you something, folks. It's called life's gamble. It's a call. What is life's gamble? Everybody has life's gamble, right? Like, let me give you an example, right? Some people are like you know something. I'm gonna go to Las Vegas and become a great porn star. Success or failure, it's all on me. Some people are like yo, you know something, I want to block. I'm gonna become a drug dealer. Get rich or die trying. Life gamble. Some people say, oh, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go all against the odds. Life gamble is when you like this. If I don't become this, right, I'm gonna, I know, you look at that old guy, right, that's uh, that's uh, uh, running, doing mail truck. I don't wanna be Rufus the mail guy. I'm going for mine. Don't be like, oh man, you want this? Job, man, you could work here 30. I don't want to work 30 years, you know, at a job. I want I got bigger dreams. You take life's gamble. You know, you live with your choices, you know. In this novel, the voyages of this took life's gamble. Same thing we're saying with the Africa stuff. It's gonna take you taking life's gamble. There's nothing guaranteed. That's another thing. People gotta stop telling people. I'm gonna start telling people, yo, something's guaranteed. No, you're taking life's gamble. In life's gamble, there's going to be winners and there's losers. But at least you had the choice, right? Whether you lost or you won, the choice was yours. What we want in a world with entitlement was what we want an entitlement to win. We want people telling us, oh, you're guaranteed to win. And also, no, there's no such movement like that. I would never tell you that you're guaranteed to win, you know? Despite all the knowledge I have and everything, there's still the, the thing of failure. There's still thing you could lose everything if you take life's gamble. But when some people are so driven, but if you're driven, and this is something that burns in your heart and soul, if you're a true believer, then this is a movement for you. You believe in nationhood. This is a movement for you. Now, now to to minimize the risk of failure everything you got to know top notch you got to start studying 
you know, I want to learn more than called up. What about cities? What about nation states? What about governments? What about something? This is what the BIO people have been doing for a decade now. You know, we've been studying stuff. A lot of people that come up with me and BIO, they know more, much as about this than I do now. They, I can, I can, they could talk me on the rug about what a, what a proper nation, what type of government, what type of this. What type of thing relationship with the host country? What, what also? What about supply chain? What about this? You got people all over learning this, that, and the other thing. That's what nation building is all about. We, it's every aspect of nation building and the physical infrastructure. Now I talked about the hard infrastructure. Now the soft infrastructure is called essential infrastructure. The essential infrastructure are your hospitals, your clinics, your uh, your uh, 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 your grocery supply chains, your medicals, or your pharmacies. All these things are critical, you know, your ambulatory ser services, you know, all these things are called soft infrastructure, essential infrastructure, critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure are your phone lines, your, your, uh, your internet, and all this stuff like this, you know, all those things that we have to do like that. We do that by turnkey. We form a corporation and then we subcontract that. We give contracts to bit on the bidders who can supply us with these things, you know. Your financial system, you know, your banking system, you know, you know, your money supply and everything like that. Those are your essential critical infrastructure. You know, so the bottom line is this. Those of us who are going to college, if I if if, if I, what I just said is foreign air anything, you need to change your major. It's a shame we got people with master's degrees. When I talk to them like that, they don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Oh, I, I never thought of that, you know? Why? Because you've been going to agree to get the what little the white man's giving you. Nation building is going to require you to go to school and get the best education. Yes, and you also you, have, uh, you, know, you have to be innovative with your thoughts and, uh, you know, literally just, you know, because you can't keep doing the same thing over and over and just expect us to just build, you know, build what we're looking to build. It's going to take some, you know, creativity uh, so, brother, um, we are at the three-hour mark. Yeah. Uh, any final words? Look, uh, join us next year in, uh, in uh, Liberia, Ghana, and all these other countries. And the bottom line is, folks, right, this is just the beginning. We're already in transition. We, uh, uh, the, the, everything we do, from when you go on and say, how can I be part of this? Go on a tour. You could afford $3,800 to go to Liberia, you know? Get your feet wet on the ground. Be part of something. You're part of something. And also, our goal one day soon, hopefully next year, we're going to start raising money to build our operations in Liberia. We want to build a, get a building. I already got land set aside. Wherever. Build a building and, a, and hopefully all the Pan-African uh, groups join, raise their own funds to help build this thing. Everything. We want to have a building and a, 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 a facility on in Liberia, right, that sole purpose is to facilitate uh the pan-african stuff so in other words people that want to come to liberia from ghana kenya whoever it is to talk and network with people from the diaspora liberia is going to be that place you know liberia is going to be that meeting place from people from the diaspora they to fellowship and build you know and there is there that these other things are going to be uh uh implemented so join us next year in Liberia, Ghana, Tanzania, and stuff like this. Just get connected with us. And also, let me tell you something, folks. It's all coming together. All these people, and I'm not wishing bad on nobody. I wish everybody would be looking. <laughs> but all, these, like, all these people that went over there, I don't need no Bamani and everything like that. Now they're like, dang, you're all falling apart. And not only that, not falling apart. They're all at each other's throats. But Bamani and us are just sitting back chilling, you know? You know, and they're all at each other's throats, and they went over there. Not everybody could do business in Africa, you know, before yeah, you do business. And some people never did any kind of business in their life, and you know, they, yeah, suddenly they're going to Africa, going to create it in an African market where you know where you you may not have the the, the best clientele base based on you know what you're looking to do, you know. So, um, you know, it's a lot of market research, and you know, it's a, you know, <laughs> I. You know, uh, some of us may make it look easy, but uh, you know, it's it's, it's serious. People uh, get tired of seeing people destroying. You know, what doesn't have to be destroyed because of um, ignorance, ego, ego, 
foolishness, bad decision, just um this Yo, Lou, it's like it's like leave your ego like, and the clan is chasing your ass out of America. I mean, I understand it's bad or maybe bad in America, but um it doesn't mean that you just just literally just grab what you can grab and just run out like you in know, other words, don't bum rush the coast. It's called the bum rush the coast. Bum rush the coast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I gotta go bum rush the coast, man. You can get on the coast, yeah. Yeah, man. No, you can't but don't bum rush the coast, you know. There's a way, there's a there's a way to do this. You know, the hard headed, I want to bum rush the coast Negroes. You know, like, oh man, you know, they go back to America, man. Fuck Africa, man. You know, yo, you tried to bum rush the coast. It wasn't like they see they see one or two buildings, right? This one thing about this. They see they, oh man, it's developed. You know, and they see one or two buildings. They say, look, you better check that country's GDP, Negro. You know, <clears throat> you know, you gotta check that GDP. You got to tell them the, the per capita, the, the, the ease of doing business, all these indexes, everything before you sign to just leave, move into a country, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, people ask me why you don't go to some countries. I'm like, the more you know, you're limited on where you can go. And then, you know, and, you know, it's some places is just not much going on. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, then people may say, hey, Liberia is a very poor country, one of the poorest in the world. And I said, you know, the difference makers library got a lot going on and it's, it's connected to us as a people. Right. As a republic that was built for us as a people. They just had, they just celebrated their independence the other day, man. 200 years. 200 years as a settlement, 175 years as a republic. Get this. The, one of the oldest republics who are still standing. They're saying, look, we're still here. You know, you know, America fell apart after 75 years. It was 75 years of civil war. <laughs> You know, Liberia never had a civil war, still standing as a republic, as a middle finger, you know, to the world. You know, they tried their best. The world tried their best to destroy Liberia, and it's still there. So we embrace that heritage. That's ours. That's our heritage and everything. And we, we, bottom line is this. We got to stop being intimidated by saying what's ours, you know. The Bible says, render unto Caesar, that's what is Caesar's, right? Render unto us what is ours, you know. That's our heritage, you know. Us diasporans, we created Liberia was as a safe haven for black people, you know? That was a safe haven for black people. That's our legacy. That's what we have, you know? So that's part of our heritage, you know? That should come. Liberia and West Africa should come before any of these other countries, you know, because we have a history there. We're not gonna just we're not gonna just think our history started with just slave trade, the castles, and everything. We also have a 200 year repatriation history with Sierra Leone and Liberia. That right there, so don't worry, people think like there's nothing happened between slavery and uh, this. No, 200 years. There's also black people who settled back in Ghana, Jamestown, you know? Black people from America and Canada settled in Jamestown. Lagos, Nigeria, you know? People don't know that history, you know? So we've been repatriating for a long time. George Washington Williams was an African-American explorer to the Congo. Watch the 2017 movie Char uh, Tarzan Grace. So Samuel Jackson played uh, George Washington Williams. He was an African American explorer. And he brought his character to life, you know. And I said, man, so we have a whole history, you know, of, of going to the continent and stuff like that. We never gave up on our continent. So don't go getting brand new on us like we're just coming out of nowhere and shit, you know. They niggas want to get brand new on us, man. What the hell are you talking about? That's why they're shocked that I know so much about Liberia. Yeah. Dude, man, like I said, the media make it seem like we don't care nothing about anything like that. But black people have been talking about Africa. My grandfather, everybody told that. They've known about the continent like that. Dude. That's why we got credit to our scholars and everything that in the in the lecture circuits and everything like that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> because without them, man, like a lot of history, I would not know if it wasn't for uh, all the, uh, the, the scholars. And people say it like this. What do you think about nation? I'm never going to disrespect the nation of Islam. You know, I'm never going to disrespect Dr. Heinrich Clark and all these scholars that came before me. You know what I'm saying? Because I wouldn't know none about this. You know, that's what piqued my mind. You know, I just listened to these brothers back in the days, you know, you know, and, and, and so I, I led me to this, you know, let's conclude. Now I got to take my, my, uh, my life into my own hands and my own way. But, you know, but, but bottom line, I, I, uh, Marcus Garvey, you know. The philosophies and opinion of Marcus Garvey, man, that book had me on my friggin', yo. That book right there, it's like, when I was reading that a couple of years ago, uh, uh, brother, 
it's like the pages were standing up. I remember one time I got off work. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning, right? And I was like, okay, it's Saturday night where I'm tired. And I said, I'll curl up in a book. And I opened a uh, philosophy of Marcus Garvey, Benjamin Marcus Garvey. He said, the Negro is no more here. Uh, uh, we're crying for justice. And he's no more heard than he was 100 years ago. We first saw no slave trip chained to the neck. When I was reading, he, and he's talking about justice and all stuff like this, it's like the pages, the words on the pages were walking up and looking and marching me. I swear to God, it seemed like the pages were like the word, the letters were in 3D. I'm like, this. it just so came to life, man. I was like, like this. And then it dawned on me just a few days ago. I said, the cry of black people in America, when we talk about building a nation and building in Africa, right? The world doesn't want to see it. No one cares about this. The only way you're going to take this shit is through force. You know, you got to freaking stomp some freaking heads to make this happen. You know, whoever it is. The bottom line is we have to do this, you know, and we can't apologize for this. The bottom line, the world's not going to say, you know, some black man, here's your reparations check. Here's some land. We're so sorry. It don't work like that. These little Laputian white people, one of these little tiny little white men, the Asian men will stomp all over your black head. You know what I'm saying? If you let them. They have you intimidated by thinking you can't build anything. Yeah, you can't create anything. That the only hope of salvation is to bow to them and salute your flag and all stuff like that. Yeah, America gave me a good life. Yeah, America gave me this like this. But I can never, my soul, I want to know what it's like to have a nation of my own. You know, I understand uh, uh, America, this, that, you know, oh, you ain't succeeding. I'm successful, man. I'm running a successful business. You know, I own my own house, everything. I want to know what it's like to have a land where we stand, where we put our flag down, you know, where our kids and sons and daughters have their hands on our salute and our flag and saying, this is our land. This is what we'll die for. I want to know what that feeling is being in a national stadium, seeing the mil our military and jets fly overhead. I want to feel that. I dream about that every night. I hope every night when I wake up and when not, that's a reality, but I know it's not. Now I say, well, Colin, you say, yes, I'm a nationalist. I'm an African, African American, African slave descendant nationalist. I want a nation of my own because I don't really think they'll say, well, just come join Africa. Look, look, if you knew what I knew and felt what I felt, do you know what a stand is? Can you call Ghana a stand? No. That's what Europeans uh, select their Negro peons from. Say they're in Nigeria. No disrespect to these countries. But there are no real strong nations. A nation, you know, you can see the fire. When you see those North Koreans, when they stomp, and the Chinese, and that stomp of how they're marching, and see how they're marching and whatnot, or we see the Russians or walking down the way. I want to know what that feels like to be part of a strong nation. That's ready for anything. Right now, we don't have that. Every one of our nations in the world, black nations, rely on charity and foreign aid. You don't qualify to become an African. So we put the definition of an African. By the end of the show, you know what the African is and what the African is not. Currently, no nation in Africa qualifies for African status. So, just kind of breaking it down, breaking it down, brother. Appreciate you, man, brother. The journey continues as we go into it. So, brother, um, you know, we'll connect back and uh, we'll give some people, you know, when you're dealing with futuristic stuff and futuristic talks, you know, you got to keep on feeding the brain. It takes some people. We'll maybe, keep doing this, brother. Some people I'll never do, get I'll do a show every some week, bro. It take, you know, a few days. And then some people may take 10, 20, 30, 50 years. And then some people are just lost. But you know what I mean? It's all educational, family. You know what I mean? It's up to you. You can stay in America and do what you're doing. You can yeah, right. America and do what you're doing. But the goal of it, wherever you're doing what you're doing, is do some black economics. Because we're all connected together. Do business with your own brothers and sisters. Yep. We're all connected together. And so, brother Kala, good night, brother. Oh, brother, I'll take it. But my family, the I'll, give you, I'll, I'll try to give you a ring tomorrow, brother. Absolutely. So, family, appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, 
one of our another power educational series. So take care, family, and we'll connect back with you.